Number 10, Treaty of Verdun. The Treaty of Verdun, or also known as Treaty de Verdun, was a contract agreed on in August 843 in which divided the Frankish Empire into three kingdoms among the surviving sons of the Emperor Louis I. The firstborn son and heir of Charlemagne. Long story short, all the grandsons were all at civil war with each other about who was getting what, what did Grant promise. The treaty followed shortly after almost three years of wars between the brothers. It was the first in a series of partitions contributing to the dissolution of Charlemagne's empire, and it is seen as a blueprint in which modern societies are based off of. Basically, the brothers all had to split what their grandfather had decreed his own into land. Lothair, the first, coolest name, Charlemagne's eldest son, received Francia Media, or the Middle Frankish Kingdom. Louis II received Francia Orientalis, or the East Franked Kingdom, and Charles II received Francia Occidentalis, or the West Frankish Kingdom. You and I both know the youngest got the most, come on, I'm just gonna say it right out. Everyone likes to talk about the eldest son this and the eldest son that, but we all know the baby gets whatever they want whenever they want, don't they, huh? I'm looking at you, Taylor. Come here, man. It's true, man. The baby gets everything. Middle child? I didn't even exist growing up. Didn't hear from him. Number nine, Underground Castle. Big Chet and I are currently replaying Ocarina of Time, so in honor of Hyrule, I gotta include this medieval castle. It was once a residence during the reign of King Henry III. This castle was actually discovered recently underneath a prison yard back in 2015. The old prison castle, we love those. Shawshank Redemption 2, medieval edition. Super recent discovery. Archaeologists discovered walls of a castle underneath the basketball court in southwest England at a former prison. Yeah, dudes were shooting threes over top of kingdom and they had no idea. How amazing is that? This was the same castle that played part in the mid 1100s during England's civil war. The castle actually fell later in the 1400s and the prison was built on the grounds later in the 1700s until it closed its gates forever in 2013. And then we were shooting threes and then we discovered it, of course. If I was a ghost haunting these grounds, I would make every shot miss easily I would just float near the net tap the ball away like nice try mm. back to prison mm. number eight stone masonry so we all know about who wrote what and who translated what to what text and which language while writing what play, which was based on who, but who built all this stuff? When we think of the Dark Ages, we can't forget the megalithic Leviathan stones carved and molded together to create the enormous Gothic castles and cathedrals that are still standing to this day. How did people do it back then? Well, masons in medieval England were responsible for building. Masons were highly skilled craftsmen, and their trade was primarily used in the building of castles, churches, and cathedrals. There were three main classes of stone masons. There was the apprentice, the journeyman, and the master mason. So what would a medieval construction site exactly look like? Well, of course, there's the master mason. He's usually the head and the overseer of the work, and he's the most skilled of the tradesmen. This is like the head honcho on site. We've all seen this guy walking around site. He's always angry, he's always yelling, hey, who's got the plans? You, give me those, what are these? Eh, yeah, backwards, you idiot. I would have put the window down there. So how did they exactly chisel out all of these castles from one giant rock? Well, they didn't. The stone had to be quarried first from quarrymen. These were not masons. Their job was to get the stone for the masons to work on out of the ground. Local stone was used first, but occasionally stone could travel vast distances, even from other countries. And so I gotta drag that boulder there all the way to Scotland? Okay. Some of the most beautiful architecture ever created can be still seen across Europe. The amount of time and skill it took for these people to have designed, constructed, and chiseled such megalithic sites still baffles me. I'd be trying to read the plan still. Oh, I s that's north. I got the... I got it, we're good. Number seven, apple bobbing. In a time where bodies were literally piling up on the side of the road, I can't believe we got apple bobbing out of the whole ordeal. That's crazy. It seems like ill timing, but it is the dark ages. What can you do? Apples historically have always been a symbol of importance. The Greek golden apple started the Trojan War. Snow White's poison apple was a symbol of importance in literature and all that good stuff and growing up. And in the middle ages, apples were viewed as a symbol of romance and fertility. These things have roots, pun intended, of course. In medieval times, bobbing for apples was flirty. It was their version of speed dating, dare I say. What happened was all the leftover apples from the big harvest were then put into a big bucket. Each apple had a villager's name on it, and then maidens would have three chances. Three chances to grab that apple with their teeth. Three chances to win a date with the English Tad Hamilton. What a weird time. Can you imagine if this was in Game of Thrones? Reek is just shivering for two seasons, bobbing for Ramsay's Bolton apples. We're like, medieval times were dark, holy sh Number six, 
The feudal system, aka feudalism, was a form of structure system existing in medieval Europe in which people would work and fight for nobles who gave them protection and land in return. A social political system in which landowners would contractually bind tenants to exchange their goods, loyalty, and simple space for safety and comfort within the laws of those ruling. Basically, this is like our renter's agreement now. I'll give you a place to stay and some heat. You give me an unfathomable and overpriced amount of shillings for these extremely low ceilings. Yeah, talk about crooks, man. This system stayed in place for more than a thousand years and managed to fizzle its way out of society somewhere in the 15th century. Not just anybody would ask to be signed to this deal. There was structure and there was order. There was a lord, aka the landowner, aka your landlord, allowing vassals, aka tenants, to rent the land by providing services especially military services. Yeah, you can stay here, but once in a while, we're gonna need you to dump a bunch of boiling water and over that wall. Is that cool? Yeah, you're fine with that. The plot of land, called a fief, was typically worked on by serfs, who were laborers, who had very few rights and were bound to the land itself. These were the lowest class of people, and they basically did any and all to stay safe on the Lord's land. Jobs would include farming, jobs would include cleaning, and was a minimum of three days work to maintain in good standing and remain stationary. Ah, sure, there was no dental or mental health days, but come on. A three day work week? Plant a couple of carrots here and there? Hey, it doesn't seem that bad. Number five, fear the dead. With The Walking Dead on their 47th season, I think it's time to take a peek into zombie history, shall we? And find out where this grim idea really started. Well, it's certainly not a new one, I'll tell you that for free. As far back as the early 1300s, residents were buried in the village of Warren Percy, where archaeologists discovered them many moons later, and they discovered marks on their bones. Cuts, burn marks, you name it. Apparently this was all done after they had passed away. But why? Scientists believe that these injuries inflicted after their untimely death were to prevent them from being reanimated. You know, coming back to life and haunting your village. To keep them in their graves, of course. Unless this dude did something to piss off an entire village that much, they were clearly afraid of this corpse coming back to haunt them. Number four. Studia Generali. This period also saw the birth of what we call the modern university. This was a culmination of material translated and taught to provide a new infrastructure to scientific scholars. Some of these new universities were registered by the Holy Roman Empire as an institution of international excellence, giving it the title Studium Generali, or better known as Studia Generale. Most of the early Studia Generale were discovered in Italy, Spain, England, and France. These places of study were considered the most prestigious places of learning in all of Europe. I bet you this school hoodies were still so expensive. Just someone's old textbook with a mustache drawn on Marcus Aurelius. The list and number of institutions began to grow as new universities were founded throughout Europe. As early as the 13th century, scholars from the Studia Generale were encouraged to speak and lecture courses at other institutions within Europe to share documents and information which led to the current academic culture seen in modern universities today. It's a TED talk, come on. There had to be one cool professor back then, like the guy who lets the class teach itself, orders pizza, has tenure, and hates the monarchy. Number three, medieval taverns. Say you want to grab a pint with the local lads. Where do you get an IPA in the dark ages? Where do we get a six pack of Arthurian ale? Well, this is the medieval ages, so instead of venturing through the woods to hopefully maybe find another town, just ask thy neighbor. That's right, in the Middle Ages, you could brew your own ale. No problem, no one's asking any questions. Give it a shot. In the late 12th century, baking bread was not freely permitted, but making ale in your basement was. Uh, I guess that's great. So the higher ups, the noble lords, they wouldn't care if you made ale and had a block party, but if you made a weak ale or it was improperly measured and then distributed, then, and only then, do you get a fine. Arrest this man at once. Number two, St. Patrick. St. Patrick was a fifth century Roman British Christian missionary and bishop in Ireland. Also known as the Apostle of Ireland, although he is the first apostle, having lived prior to the current laws of the Catholic Church. He is considered a saint in the Catholic Church and is regarded as the Enlightener of Ireland. The dates of Patrick's life are not certain, but there is a consensus that he was active in Ireland during the 5th century, making his rounds as a missionary, speaking the good word of God. But let's get into what everyone talks about with this guy. The good stuff, like slamming a green Guinness or getting all the snakes out of Ireland. I mean, I love the structure and the faith and stuff, but also chasing every snake out of an entire country with a walking stick? Shoo! Shoo, you fool, you bleeding bleeder, go, go! Do you know how big Ireland is? St. Patrick's Day is on March 17th, the supposed date of his death in 461 AD. It is enjoyed inside and outside Ireland as a religious and cultural holiday and remains a celebration of Ireland itself. And finally, number one, Dancing plague. A medieval plague, but make it groovy. Yeah, let's start dancing. That's right, the dancing plague. This was a real danger back in 1518. I'll try not to laugh, but it's, I can't, 
I'll try. This was perhaps one of the weirdest events in history. Fra Trofea was the first victim of said plague. She was moving her body around frantically, so much so that it resembled a dance or something, in the middle of the Holy Roman Empire. And as if that wasn't weird already, dozens of others began to join. And then more, and then more, all moving their bodies with a similar wacky, frantic twist. This was long before Chubby Checker came along, so we still have no idea what was going on here. Like, we're out of guesses at this point. This twist lasted for months. People were dropping on the spot. It was scary and confusing. In total, there were around 400 victims that fell to this mysterious illness. That's a lot of deaths, that's a lot of real deaths. This was documented in 16th century historical records, so I don't think the story is made up per se. No one would make this up, it's terrifying. A Catholic saint at the time, Saint Vitus, was believed to have the power to curse people with said dancing plague. What an amazing power also. Guy starts moonwalking away, you're like, beat it. Some suggest this was the cults, others believe they ate toxic rye. Who's to say for sure? Either way, we're all dancing. Number 10. The Doomsday Book, 1085. The Doomsday Book was created under William the First, also known as William the Conqueror. Like, you're already the first, man. You don't need two names, come on. This guy basically drew up a book to document people's money so that he could tax them. Oh yeah, this is the very first time surveyors went town to town and recorded how much money you would owe for simply just doing you. Men would show up at your house asking how much money you made and document your spending habits. Five shillings on groceries, huh? Okay and five on that phone plan. Look, tax season's coming up, Arthur. It's not looking good, man. Talk about a bunch of crooks, huh? Imagine owing someone money for just trying to make an honest living. Yeah, thank God that didn't catch on, right guys? Oh, speaking of, I got a phone H&R block. Number nine, The Crusades. A three-part miniseries spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for the proprietorship over sacred sites and the land in the East Mediterranean. A three-part miniseries spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for proprietorship over sacred sites and land in the East Mediterranean. Wars that resulted in six million deaths. The Knights Templar, a brotherhood of highly trained soldiers horseback bashing their way through the East. These guys were the real deal, almost like the Navy SEALs of their time. We've seen these paintings, the elite fighting force with the red cross painted on their chests. I wonder if they had to do a hell week. These soldiers were the most trained and savage fighters in all the Christian armies. Richard I leading the third and final crusade, earning him the name Richard the Lionheart. Back then the names were always something so aggressive and scary. It was never like Richard the Clownfish or Henry the Pygmy Goat. No, 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 we need fear way more fear. Number eight, the Magna Carta. The year is 1215. We need some laws, people. This document was one of its kind. A document setting out the laws and limitations from the common man to King John himself. A legal system written down so that there are clear do's and don'ts. No free man shall be seized, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled, or ruined in any way, nor in any way proceeded against except by the lawful judgment of his peers. And the law of the land. Did you get all that? Right that down. Except women. They don't have laws. And they can't act in place. Sometimes people needed to face the music. And even animals. Huh? That's right, animals. Being tried. In a court. A lively and popular event trying any law-breaking animal from goats to pigs to even chickens. Ladies and gentlemen of the court, did you, Mr. Feathersworth, peck the floor, yes or no? Objection, your honor, leading the witness. My brain can't fathom this, guys. Number seven, the Battle of Bannockburn. This infamous battle between Scotland and England was one of the most important battles of the Middle Ages. The end of the bloody war for independence. Basically, Scotland was like, yeah, we're gonna go over here and roll our R's. The gruesome wooden wars were caused by the English invading Scotland in 1296. A leader slowly rising the ranks, William Wallace, the guardian of the King of Scotland himself, holds off the English forces and is knighted a hero to Scotland. Unfortunately, like every hero back then, he was also hated. He was captured, hanged, drawn, and quartered. Like, why do you have to do all that after he dies? Like, he's dead. Not fun. The battles between Scotland and England ended in 1314 with Robert the Bruce securing Scotland's independence, adding like 45 more dialects to the UK. Freedom! Number six, the Black Death. Ooh, talk about a curveball. The year's 1348. People are saying things like, don't let the bed bugs bite. Clearly not a very clean and safe time. The Black Death, AKA, Pestilence, aka the Great Mortality, or simply known as the Plague. Single handedly, the worst pandemic ever recorded in history, wiping out somewhere between 70 to 200 million people. Ooh, now I get where Bless You comes from. 
someone sneezed back then and everyone's dead at 14. This is where we see those doctors in the terrifying bird outfits with the long noses stuffed with garlic and herbs. Um, excuse me? Yeah, he's not wearing a mask. I I'm just trying to watch a cat publicly get skinned. Yeah, six feet please. Some doctors prescribed urinating on a person so that the bad smell would drive out the infection. Can you imagine? Just a doctor writing you up a script and go ahead and pee on yourself about four to five times a day. Take with food. Should be gone early next week. And just let me put my mask back on here before you leave. There you are. The plague started in Europe in October 1347 when 12 ships from the Black Sea docked at the Sicilian port of Messina. Most sailors aboard the ships were already dead, but those who were still alive were covered head to toe in black boils that oozed pus and blood. Ugh. Sometimes the Black Death included fever, chills, vomiting, diarrhea, temporary loss in motor skills, and then of course, death. Number five, Joan of Arc. Finally, a woman in the Middle Ages. Who to thunk? Joan of Arc was considered and still is revered the heroine of France for her role in the Siege of Orleans during France's Hundred Year War with England. Joan of Arc, a peasant with faith on her side, had believed that God had chosen her to lead France in victory against England and had spoken to her since she was young. At only age 17, she had stolen men's armors, a white horse, and like a Valkyrie riding into battle, she had convinced an entire army that she was appointed by God to win. And then did! That's the most badass thing I've ever heard my entire life. After such a miraculous victory, her reputation spread among France, and upon her capture and death at 19, the Maid of Orleans herself would forever live on as one of the greatest saints and symbols of the country of France. Number 4. Henry V. Another war? All these people do is kill each other. Does anyone fish? Or golf? No one, huh? Just swords and heads, swords and heads. A history itself. This time, England beats France. King Henry V, Prince Hal himself, leans into his kingly duties, demolishing France and what Shakespeare would delve into years to come. The Battle of Agincourt is one of England's most celebrated victories and was one of the most important triumphs in the Hundred Years' War. Then, should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment, Henry V, prologue. Good stuff. How come these guys didn't just like rap battle or play soccer or something? Like an arrow right through the chest is way worse than a red card. Just saying. Hey, speaking of soccer. Number three, mob football. I'm not talking about the mafia. Put a thousand on Brady, would you? I'm talking about mob football, also known as folk football. It's just like our modern day soccer, town versus town. Except it has an unlimited amount of players. And there's only two rules to the game. Get the inflated pig's bladder over the opposing team's lines on the other side of town and no murdering. I mean, I guess this is closer to rugby? Yeah, this, this is literally just rugby. This game was played competitively and eventually outlawed at Oxford University in 1555. Just a guy named Jeeves in a polo. Oh uh, yeah, I play uh, mob football at Oxford. <sighs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm also in a frat. This game got so out of hand, it was banned numerous times in England. There is great noise in the city caused by hustling over large balls from which many evils may arise, which God forbid. We command and forbid on behalf of the king, on pain of imprisonment, such game to be used in the city of the future. Thankfully, this game has calmed down over the years and now has become the most popular played and watched game across the world. Go Liverpool! Number two, the printing press. The printing press is a machine that was designed for the mass printing of text mostly in form of books and newspapers. With an unknown date of origin, first invented in China, this machine designed in the 15th century by Johannes Gutenberg was a revolutionary new form of writing which would only change the direction of history with the mass production of uniform text. Eh, long story short, people didn't have to get the world's worst wrist cramp writing Hamlet over and over again. To be, or not to be, 86 more folios? The alphabetical metal keys would be placed into the device and slammed into the paper, pressing ink upon the parchment. You know there's gotta be some books half written in purple ink because they just ran out of black. Come on, we've all been there. Ink's expensive. Number one, William Shakespeare. The bard himself, arguably the most influential writer of the English language. William Shakespeare was born in Stratford, England. One of the easiest ways we can look back into the dialogue and lifestyle used by the people living in the Middle Ages. This playwright documents the world in which he lives from 1564 to 1616. Due to Shakespeare's unbelievable talent for building and fabricating an array of diverse stories and characters via players, 
Modern day is able to see the Middle Ages and the similarities and differences the people were experiencing. His plays are based in the environment that they were written in. He writes about diseases, he writes about monarchy, he writes about women's rights. Okay, so no one actually got turned into a donkey by some fairies in the woods, but some of those wars actually did happen. And some of those kings and queens were really twisted. How this man created so many brilliant works and stories, all part of the mystery. Kicking off the list at number 10, an arming squire. Being a knight, okay, obviously this sounds cool on paper. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing lady, the gal on the back of said horse. They're saving the damsel in distress or something, right? Sometimes they lose a hand like Jamie Lannister, but that's just what being a knight is all about, right? Also, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Game of Thrones nine years ago. It wasn't always a fairy tale epic being a knight. First of all, this process starts when you're seven years old as well. So you would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you became a squire. Ah, yes, a noble squire. We've heard this term before. What do they do? Uh, well, it's, it's a knight's intern. Yeah, not an ideal job to have when you're young, but it's a job nonetheless. Also, you had no choice, so you, you had to do it. Welcome to the Middle Ages. Arming squires, they had a lot of responsibility. Arming squires would repair a knight's armor while they were still wearing it. Yeah, how fun is that? Oh, which buckle was it? Ah, uh, yes, that one. Mm. Yeah, fixing up chainmail on a grown man's thigh. Not ideal, welcome to the Dark Ages, pretty dark. Also, after these epic, messy battles, arming squires would have to clean everything off of their armor. Yeah, everything. A lot of yuck going on in that business day. This was long before Dawn soap was also a thing, so they had to clean with urine. Yeah, gross, so gross, it gets worse and worse. Welcome to the Dark Ages. Number nine, Plague Bearer. Yep, this one's as awful as it sounds. The title of this one really gives it away. Ah, the hot summer of July 1665. What to do with all of these poor souls who have been hit by the plague in the Dark Ages? Where do we put them? What do we do? You can't just hide them all in the catacombs this time around. So now what? Well, a plague bearer, he's got your back. Church wardens would organize burials, right? This was a normal thing even back in the Dark Ages in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up a little bit. If somebody had the plague, these guys would be responsible for transporting them far, far away and then burying them. A church would house these plagued souls away from society. How grim is that? But it's probably a great call, all things considered. Poor guy. Number eight, a knight. When we think of the knights in you know, the dark ages and stuff, we often forget about the silly royal duties that one had to attend to. Yeah, you thought jury duty sucked. Oh boy. Beastly justice. You ever heard of this? If not, buckle in. Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. Yeah, they were put on trial as well, as well as humans. It's wild to look back at a knight and all the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact they also had to wake up early and attend court like a noble, like royal court where a wild animal was now taking the stand. Like what a joke, I'd be like, really? Do I have to be here? I woke up at 4.30, what's going on? Yeah, this would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, you know, being confused and being an animal and all. But the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was somehow involved in this whole ordeal. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself, right? How weird is that? In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage, apparently. But instead of just, you know, setting the animals free or putting them down or whatever, they just took them to court. A real court, like a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say that we gotta do a list on that. That's a terrible job. That's one of the worst jobs ever, I, I lightly introduced here. These pigs were then hung from a gallows tree. It was so horrible. The dark ages, dark, right? A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. Yeah, being a knight sucked. Number seven, leech collector. I always enjoyed catching frogs growing up. That was always fun, but apparently I, I gotta step my game up. <laughs> This is weak. A leech collector is, well, exactly what you think. Back when medicine was pretty much non-existent, sickness was just wafting throughout these old towns, just eh, moving through towns. Like the G from the Goosebumps logo, just haunting towns, moving through. Scariest intro ever, eh? So the solution back in the day was the classic, oh, if you feel sick, maybe try bleeding for a bit. Mm, see if that helps. Yeah, they would use horses' legs to lure out these leeches, but most of the time, these leech collectors would have to get in and get dirty and just grab them themselves. They would have to swim around and touch as many things as possible. They would make contact with as many leeches as possible. How gross is that? That was the best way to collect them, really. I would have fainted so often, that is horrible. The loss of blood here was obviously so intense, so it was a you know horrible job to have. And on top of that, you gotta look out for the same reason they need leeches in the first place. 
Disease, yeah, that's still out there. Leech collectors were so common throughout the 18th century that leeches basically were extinct at that point. We almost lost leeches, oh, so close. Number six, jesters. The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century, so pretty OG. These fools were hired to liven up the party, you know, dance and be silly, wear pajamas. Most of you have an image of a jester in your head, you know, jumping around on tables, telling jokes. That's actually pretty accurate. Yeah, it was pretty fun. It was one of the best jobs to have, obviously. This title of a minstrel or a fool, rather, it was an honor to have. The fool's payment also was was no funny business, that was good stuff. Roland Le Petier, he was like a major jester back in the day. This guy got 30 acres of land from King Henry II. Just here, here you go, to show up and fart and be funny. Have all this land. That's like a kingdom, you have a kingdom because you're funny and you're silly. He would whistle, jump around, and literally fart on people. On Christmas day, this guy would come over and just ruin your entire breakfast and just be like, yeah, I have all this land. And then he would take off. Crazy, you just ruined Christmas, sir. Stop farting on my food and family, thank you. I would never want to be a jester. They had to also like go into battle and like spread bad news too. It was fun and silly, but they were also royal. They had to do lousy stuff too. Number five, groom of the stool. Nowadays, higher ups in the office, they have assistants, you know, to grab your coffee for you. Maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off, you know, doing your businessman stuff. Assistants are vital today. The groom of the stool though, that was, uh, huh, that was a bit much. We have some labor laws put in place now. I don't think we're gonna see any online ads opening for a groom of the stool. We'll see though, fingers crossed, I had good benefits. Back in the dark ages, this role was vital and respected. It was created by King Henry VIII and this role was to assist the king and specifically assist his bowel movements. You had a box that you carried with you at all times. That's where the, that's where the magic happened. The dark magic happened in this box. You would literally follow the king around until he needed to go to the washroom, until he needed said box. Porta potties weren't a thing back then and there's no way you're going to catch that king squatting in the woods. In fact, you wouldn't even catch that king wiping his own behind. That chore was also reserved for the groom of the stool. Yeah, lucky you, right? In this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl. The whole setup would be in there. You're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? A prisoner? Somebody who lost their sense of smell, hopefully? No, only sons of noblemen could take on this role. And in doing so, they also gain access to every room in the castle, tons of clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, you name it. And of course, a high pay. Always helps, thank God. That's maybe the worst job in history, maybe. We're almost there, you'll see. Number four, divorce lawyers. If you've seen Game of Thrones, you've heard of trial by combat. That was the that was the norm back in the day. You know, you fight for your freedom. That's great. But what about divorce by combat? What in the Mr. and Mrs. Smith is happening? Was this real? I can't believe this. If you and your significant other weren't getting along in the dark ages, instead of, you know, dishing out thousands on couples therapy and signing all that paperwork and getting it done with and going your separate ways, no, instead they would battle each other. Like combat. It was an organized event too. It had restrictions in place for the husband. It's pretty hilarious to think back on. Like the husband would have to stand in a hole with one hand tied behind his back while the wife ran circles around this hole with a sack full of rocks. A sack full of rocks, how intense is that? That's why you don't cheat in the dark ages, Lancelot, okay? Just take the barn, take the horse, take it all, I quit. Get me out of this hole, untie me. Number three, toshers. Toss a coin to your tosher, here we go. This was one of the worst jobs back in the day and it wasn't even a legal job. Shh, don't tell. If you don't need, uh, if you don't need toshers, Keep, keep their secret, you know? Early 19th century London, I know, a little more modern here, but definitely worth a mention. These toshers would spend all their time in sewers below London trying to find coins or valuables that have been just accidentally washed away. Yeah, they would just search for scrap metals, anything really that nobody else wants to go down and claim, or reclaim rather. It was worth the plunge as well. A lot of these folks would make around 20,000 a year. Just gotta do this a lot, and you're good. Number two, dentist, doctor, surgeon, spy. Dentists were not a thing in the Middle Ages, you know. Dr. Downer didn't politely tell you to floss more and then shake your hands while you're watching a show, getting a cleaning. No, it wasn't like that at all. They did have a barber. They had one guy, he did it all. A barber from the Dark Ages. Yeah, this appointment is gonna suck, my friends. Cavity, toothache, maybe you accidentally bit a rock, chipped a molar. They would only pull these teeth. That was the only solution. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, bloodletting, you know, the classic three-in-one appointment we all have to do every month. Doctors were seen throughout history and they've seen a lot of horrible stuff. Back in the 1500s, patients were walking in with an arrow sticking out of their legs. Yeah, instead of cutting the tip off and pulling the opposite way, the arrow removed mover would come in and then, you know, cut into the injury, opening it more. That's always great. And then you would hold it open and then you'd pull the entire arrow back out of your leg. Yeah, what a fun job. Or chest. Wherever the arrow went, you had to figure that out. It's poor soul. 
And finally, number one, the Rat Catcher. Another Game of Thrones classic. If you're a rat person, I know there's a lot of people who do like rats, like rat tricks and they have like cool rat friends, that's awesome. I'm not one of those people. I'm not bashing you, but I am bashing this job. This would suck. First of all, rats as a medieval punishment was horrible. Where do I even begin with this one? This was one of the worst punishments for the rats as well. This is a two for one when it comes to pain. A rat trap involved a man being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped to his abdomen or chest. And then inside this enclosure, they were rats and they were also like tucked away and then historically they would heat the uh, metal enclosure and the rats would panic and try and get out and they would chew through the softest part which in this case was your chest or abdomen it was horrible it was an absolute nightmare but these rats had to come from somewhere or rather someone as the name hints towards rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in or rather out of a castle it's an important role you know just like being a fool or a literal walking talking toilet there needs to be a chasseur de rats back in those times rats and mice were the leading source of spread disease and with these castles being big and dark there were probably a lot of them hiding. Black rats were a common household problem so we need to get those out. So in comes the well-respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try new spells to get rid of the rats. Wasn't always helpful, wouldn't work. More often than not didn't work. So poison powders were the next main trick here. Also the Pied Piper, he was an OG historically. He would do a musical number to exterminate your pets. If anything, he should be getting a bonus. Any rat catcher actually, today or back in the dark ages, you deserve a bonus, my friend. You're a brave soul. So in at number 10, we have witch marking. I'm trying to avoid some things we've already covered in similar videos. So while we've discussed witches, let's talk about witch marks. So during the English and Scottish witch hunt days, there was a belief that witches always had a natural skin mark. This could be a mole or a scar or a pock mark or even a really bad zit. So when they came across a woman whom they thought were a witch, but she didn't have any of those markers, that was the end of it, right? She isn't a witch? Well, no. They gave her a skin mark instead, specifically by using a pricking needle, which the witch hunters would carry. These needles repeatedly pricked the flesh of the accused until it produced the result that wouldn't bleed, but was insensitive to pain, which fulfilled the criteria of a witch's mark. It's a subtle punishment for something that they were yet to be accused of, because by giving them the mark, they could now accuse them. These witch Hunt days were a whole mess. Number nine is marking your territory. Not in a cool, sexy, I got a tattoo way, more in a scarlet wetter kind of way. As you'll learn in this video, a woman who cheated or even was single and just engaged in intercourse of her own free will could be classified as a sinful adulterer and cheater and be punished, usually a lot worse than a man. So when Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote The Scarlet Letter, he took inspiration from real life events. The letter, which for the character Hester Prynne was just a red A, was usually the letters AD, which stands for adultery, as outlined by the Plymouth Colony Law in 1658. Multiple accounts across Europe verify that someone who has been marked was to be seen out in public without it, could be subject to public whipping and other public humiliations that ensured a person's social alienation. Like in the Scarlet Letter, when Puritan minister Arthur refuses to admit his sinful side of the act with Hester, he's branded with an A in his chest. In a man's case, while this was of course painful, it was allowed to be hidden. He also didn't have to face a societal consequence consequences the way any woman would have. For number eight, we travel to discuss status degradation. While it still persists today, not everyone knows what it means. So essentially, you do something wrong, oopsies, you lose some of your basic human rights. You could steal something, have relations out of wedlock, cheat on your partner, miss some work. Every empire that has used this tactic has had a variety of ways that you could mess up and receive this punishment. Naturally, in times where a woman was property and couldn't buy things, own things, or do things, or breathe without having a man's side eye her for it, this was a monumental punishment to receive. Under the Roman Empire, Augustus, who reigned from 27 BCE to 14 CE, a woman guilty of adultery could lose several rights as a citizen and suffer a financial burden. Noble women in the Kingdom of Korea during the Chosan Dynasty faced a similar degradation of their societal status if they were found guilty of remarrying as a widow. This intentionally made it hard for Korean women to remarry as they would have nothing to offer a new husband, no inherited lands or funds, and a societal belief deemed her as used goods. Even the descendants of widows of the time who had remarried faced status degradation. They were barred from ever holding office. Adulteresses in the Chosan were stripped of many of their rights and privileges once they were demoted to low born statuses. As serious as these punishments may seem, some high status women who committed adultery in the Chosan dynasty faced an even graver punishment, which was death. So why take someone's status from them as a criminal punishment? Well, because aside from the fact as a woman you'd essentially be left jobless, homeless, and without any family, it's because 
of a cheater's fama, number seven. While fama is a Latin term for reputation and good name, every country had its own version of this fama. And if you cheated, or were even just accused of cheating in 13th century France, which by the way happened a lot because husbands just want to get rid of their wives, the woman was always the center of the punishment, even if that was the man who had been cheating. This is because the status is all a woman ever had for a very long time, and the name of her family's reputation laid on her shoulders. Thus, all that pressure to be religious, virtuous, and most importantly, a submissive woman. The customary laws of Agen province list public humiliation for both the wife and her lover as the appropriate punishment for adultery. If the man could escape before or even after arrest, he could get off without any punishment and his partner had to face her punishment alone. The woman got no such reprieve, even if she was just the mistress he cheated on his own wife with. In fact, if she tried to escape arrest, it warranted a death sentence. Women whose fama suffered through public shaming walk of atonement were no longer deemed honorable members of society, and seeing as standing of individuals before law at the time was often based on their reputations, what others thought of them, and how they behaved in public, she'd be left, as I said, homeless, familyless, and dejected. For my Game of Thrones people, think Cersei. Number six is no protection. Get your mind out of the gutter. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, there's no protection from capital punishment. While civil laws were easier to work around by just getting married alone, you can borrow money or property, you can buy things that you couldn't before and sign contracts, the criminal law didn't bend to a married woman, as she faced the same penalties as an unmarried one. Now, there are technically one exception, pregnancy, but only because it could potentially be a boy, which is insane. Additionally, all women were exempt from certain torts, such as the breaking wheel. But man, when a woman got capital punishment, it was the one and only form, and it was the most brutal and painful one, burning at the stake. By the way, they claim this was the only and the necessary option of execution for a woman, as it's a preservation of female modesty. Apparently, other forms of execution were unbecoming of a woman. Although there may be some truth to this wild justification, modern historians have rounded it down to just misogyny, as well as a deep-rooted suspicion and dislike of women as the root of this execution decision. Essentially, when given the opportunity to punish a woman, men went ham for it and wanted to see her suffer as much as possible. So women experienced the worst executions of the Dark Ages. Number five is why women want to stay in religious favor. In medieval Europe, a device was literally invented for women who defied their religious beliefs. Pyramid shaped and made of wood, the woman who dared to defy her god should fear this. See, they would bind the woman's hands and ankles and then sit one of her two genital openings on the peak of the pyramid. She would then be incapable of shifting her weight anywhere else and was forced to put her weight down on the tip. It would slowly slide upwards and inwards and the longer she was pressed down on it, the more her body split apart. These women would be left for days on end sometimes on this device. The device's slow, agonizing death can be compared only to the shame it inflicted as well. The woman was stripped nude and forced to suffer this torture in public for all to see. Number four is harems. To start, the word harem is derived from the Arabic word harim, and it often means sacred, forbidden, and sometimes sanctuary. This was an accurate name for, as only women's household members and some related male members were allowed to enter a harem, which was an honored women's space. The harem was the ultimate symbol of a sultan's power, his ownership of women women, mostly slaves, was a sign of wealth, power, and sexual prowess. The seclusion from public gaze also inflated this power more so. But a royal harem could be a place of filth and stink where chaos and emotions ran high. This was the price of being property. Used by the emperors and his sons, you could either be favored or so hated that one day you vanish and rumors of your exile whirl amongst your peers. These ladies usually did not have the liberty to move out of the harem as they liked, but inside the harem they could move around as they pleased. There was no sisterhood in them either. Socializing amongst themselves was usually not friendly and jealousies were shown directly. Makes sense, as status and position of authority in the harem were determined by the place that they had in the emperor's favor, and to give the king his first male child was a great competition in this regard, resulted in unpleasantness through the royal harem. Everyone tried their best to please the emperor and turned her bad qualities like jealousy, aggression, or short tempered attitude onto other women. Seeing as many of these women were stolen from outside the empire, let alone inside, frustration with language barriers and culture clash was also a huge source of contempt. Sometimes the women would lie to the sultan to have others disposed of, or they'd simply gang up on one another. Regardless, harems were places of drama, inequality, and a race to be favored as a ticket out of sexual service.
servitude. Hidden sexuality is number three. There were plenty of mainstream laws in medieval and middle Europe against male homosexuality, and while it wasn't considered as serious, lesbianism still posed a threat to the ideals of a male centric societal order. A law written in 1260 France stated that women caught engaging in homosexuality shall undergo mutilation on her first and second offense, and on her third, she must be burned. This is one of the only laws to specify consequences for lesbianism, but the 13th century and Christian perspective of sex radicalized further into modesty. Lesbianism was equated to sodomy at that time point and therefore carried a similar sentence. Death. There is sufficient evidence of lesbians in Middle Ages, most of which come from the church. Turns out many nuns were sexually active lesbians, and the church directly acknowledges their presence by having to pass laws establishing penalties for nuns caught having sexual relations with each other. So not only were they having sexual relations with each other, but it was enough that the church had to do something about it. For example, during the 8th century, Pope Gregory III gave penances of 160 days for unnatural female acts. Still, no torture or death though. This this is because as long as phallus or other phallus shaped objects weren't used or involved, the relationship wasn't considered real intercourse. Real intercourse involved procreation after all. So eventually, when Christianity upped the ante however, any sexual act that caused pleasure, which now included lesbian intercourse or plain old self stimulation, was now considered sin. So like most women of the middle ages, even bisexual and lesbian women had to settle down for a man at that point. Anyone who struggled with sexuality can imagine how dreadful it would be to live that way. Divorce was a nightmare, which is why it's number two in our countdown. Laws worldwide were unforgiving of divorces, literally always to the woman. In Chinese laws, a woman could only divorce her husband if he mistreated her family, not even her. He, on the other hand, could divorce her for anything. Some accepted grants for divorce were failure to bear a son, evidence of being unfaithful, lack of piety to the husband's parents, theft, suffering a virulent or infectious disease, jealousy, and talking too much. A pretty superficial list, but in Chinese society, Society, divorce was a serious action with social repercussions for both parties, so consequently divorces were not as common as they may sound. She could not be divorced if she had no family to return to or if she had gone through the three year mourning period for her husband's dead parents. And speaking of family, during the Han Dynasty, unmarried women brought a special tax on their family and women with babies were given a three year exemption from the tax and their husbands a one year. So there was a huge push to get married. Meanwhile in medieval England, their similarities are stark. They too had a small number of divorces despite an expansive list of reasons to do so, such as there was a discovered blood relation between the individuals, or impotence, or fear used to obtain consent, marriages entered into under false pretenses, things like that. In many of these cases, the lack of sufficient evidence made them difficult to prove and thus deterred people from taking their cases to court. And number one is the tradition of foot binding. It existed for around 10 centuries, and there are women alive today who still have feet that are the result result of feet binding. Foot binding involves systematically breaking the feet and shaping them inwards. This tradition started in the five dynasties ten states period of the 10th century, when beloved concubine of the emperor built a gilded lotus flower stage and performed a dance on bound hoof shaped feet. Being a beloved concubine, the other concubines of the emperor attempted to imitate her feet to curry his favor. So foot binding began within the royal court and spread through China as the next fashion fad. It's done in a ritualistic ceremony accompanied by a variety of traditions to ward off any bad luck. They began by tucking the toes under the feet and using a long, tight ribbon wrapped up to the ankle to hold it all in place. Anytime the foot grew, they broke it inwards more, a process usually taking two to three years. The foot would remain bound for the rest of a woman's life. There is a whole list of issues this caused. Outside of extreme agony and being a handicap, it caused some women pain for the rest of their life. Their walk was changed, as was their posture, and the idealism of a slim body to lighten the pressure on one's feet was all the rage. The Binding of feet actually caused the women to develop strong muscles in their hips, thighs, and buttocks, so much that the characteristics were considered physically attractive to Chinese men of the area, aka the girlies were thick. When colonization came to China, Western women boycotted foot binding, going as far as to catch women with bound feet and cut off their bindings. A humiliation because these women would never ever show their bare feet to anyone, let alone even husbands. And many of these women lost their husbands when the Western boycott worked. A lot of girls who had had 
their feet bound in order to become marriageable, suddenly found themselves abandoned by their husbands because foot binding was no longer fashionable at all. Starting us off is cutting edge courtship, quite literally in this case. It was traditional in some Nordic countries to have courtship customs involving knives and daggers. This is due to sacrificial nature in their original belief. The purpose of a dagger is prevalent for that after all, but it was also due to its functionality. In Finland, when a girl came of age, her father let it be known that she was available for marriage by providing her with an empty sheath. The girl would wear an empty sheath attached to her girdle, skirt. If a suitor liked the girl, he would put a pokoko knife in that sheath, which the girl would keep if she was interested in him. If she wasn't, she could just toss that anywhere. The knives were often custom, so a man would be able to woo a woman with unique details and imagery on a blade, but could also offer an heirloom or traded blade. Seeing as women of the Nordic region didn't shy away from handwork such as farming, jewelry making, clay working, etching, clothiers, and even some positions like smelting, a blade was a thoughtful and convenient gift that also said, I love you a whole dagger's worth. Something so romantic about giving someone a gift they could quite literally kill you with. In the meantime, while the scans are giving blades, the English are being taught the no-no days and the no-no ways. In layman's terms, they were being told how to have intercourse and when. That just doesn't make for a fun title. You may be familiar with these laws and regulations. They've come up in some of our other medieval and middle age videos. This was a time period where the church had a lot to say in state affairs. Not to say that it doesn't now, but they were able to make determinations such as intercourse schedules around the religion. Real laws were in place that people could not have sex on Sundays, Thursdays, or Fridays due to religious reasons. Whenever a holiday had a fasting period, such as Lent, abstinence was expected then as well. If anyone was to deviate from the set rules by having intercourse, they were committing a grave sin. These laws were written in penentials, which were books that indicated what was allowed under the church rules and what was not. Oral, backdoor, premarital, and self-inflicted intercourse were banned in these books. Now thankfully, their wide-range taboos included some good stigmas to have, such as interbreeding, so that minimized people keeping it in the family and messing up our future populations. But even with sexual laws, men could be knaves, which is just an old timely way of saying being a dog. Now I'm not saying ladies couldn't have itchy feet and dog their way around too, we do it now and we've been doing it then, but it was a lot worse for ladies to be caught back then. So the general consensus is that it was rare and when it did happen it was usually affairs outside of a marriage. In general, young medieval daters had to be cautious. While peasant marriages were a little more than saying we're married most of the time, reputation, especially for a lady, was huge as was virginal status. Men of higher status often sought out beautiful peasant girls for affairs. Sometimes they benefited the woman greatly and she'd become an heir to a status child, thus elevating her own. But for the most part, it was pure carnal enjoyment men were after in a time when women were told to do the opposite. And so it became a game of men trying to win a single woman into doing the act. She had everything on the line while he usually had nothing. Secret flings were frowned upon to say the least and were often seen as a sign of potential trouble, hence the English ballad that would warn of knaves preying on young fair maidens at country fairs. A young woman caught having affairs was a wild scandal that could even be punished for or put to death. So making the decision to bow to a lord's or even a common man's pressure could quite literally destroy a woman's whole life and being. Yet it's still a decision women made. Ah, hormones. Yet when it comes to marriage, it's always love versus politics. Medieval marriages tended to be negotiations, particularly around dowry, but it wasn't all about money. It was very important that a noble woman is a virgin at marriage at purely out of pragmatic reasons. Marriage after all was an alliance union of two families that required healthy and admirable legitimate children to be truly locked in. It's for this reason as well as the violent men in society that the church law stated that the degree of pressure to encourage a marriage could not sway a constant man or woman, aka no forced consent. What was forced however was up to debate, so don't be too proud of them for having that law in place. A woman was able to call off her marriage up until it occurred for this reason, as was a man. Should this occur, dowry was either returned in full or only partially as a fee for the failed union. Alongside this was the courtly love direction romance and marriage began to take in the middle mid ages during a Shakespearean and theatrical influence. Marriage started to become idealized, we'll circle back to how this affected people later, but lower classes consistently did marry for love since there is little to be gained materially from marrying for them. For most part there was no official ceremony that the social level marriage was more like hey we're married now and living together. By 1400 AD there were actually many laws decreeing marriages needed to start becoming a public affair and one may wonder how often people did marry in secret. Next up watch lords try to impress ladies with a lance measuring contest. As mentioned, courtly love and chivalry are important facets of medieval society and culture, and seeing as tournaments and displays of masculinity were centerpieces of this culture, it's no surprise it made its way into courting. By 12th century England, tournaments were in full swing, usually
usually consisting of jousting and melees, a big organized throwdown between knights that were not expected to be dangerous but occasionally resulted in serious injury or death. These tournaments were respectable places to meet potential suitors and singles flocked to these spots to watch heroic knights joust and parade themselves around while noble maidens looked on adoringly. Some contemporary conservative commentators as well as the church, however, complained that the tournaments were places of frivolity, scandal and lust. Buzz kills. Don't worry, if sword fighting isn't your to forte, then poetry or songwriting were also popular ways to express your love to a lady. And remember, when meeting a beloved, dress to impress, but not so much that you cause a scandal. Remember, sumptuary laws exist. It'd be pretty embarrassing to be arrested and sentenced on your first date with someone. It was advised that medieval women getting ready for a date should wear their tallest steeple hat and their best dress, and top it off with their finest linen wimple. This helped to elongate the neck. A long neck on a woman was considered beautiful. So was a bunch of other weird stuff that we'll get to in a second. Meanwhile, men should always remember on a date to wear their best gown and hose, which are pantyhose. But as said, don't dress too posh. The sumptuary laws of medieval England, such as the statute concerning diet and apparel of 1363, tried to ensure that citizens did not dress or consume above their social status. These rules included what kind of fur trims could be worn and by whom, colors, hats, patterns, shoes, and all the whole shebang. Check out our video Top 10 Unusual Medieval Laws You Never Knew Existed to learn more about sumptuary laws and laws of fashion. The rules of etiquette will most definitely help you avoid scandal when invited over to the family home of your potential lover, and they were genuinely as follows. 1. Keep your hands clean. Don't stroke the dog or the cat. Be sure to wipe your fingers on the tablecloth instead of licking them. 2. Bones are not to be gnawed, and don't pick your teeth with the sharp irons. 3. Don't eat with a fork. Forks were used to prepare food, but most medieval Europeans thought forks were an odd thing to eat with. 4. Don't eat with a knife either. Many people carried the knives on them on their belt to carve up the food before eating, but don't eat with it. 5. Okay. If it's a liquid, use a spoon. People tended to eat with their hands for everything else. 6. Don't sit too close to the salt cellar. Salt was expensive and associated with prestige, so it's a good dating tip at a big dinner to see who sat closest to the salt cellar. And seven, you can burp, but look up at the ceiling as you do so. And eight, remember you must not urinate at the host's premises unless you're staying overnight and it's before bed. Obviously, some of these things like wiping your hands on a tablecloth, eating without a knife, or holding your pee until it's time to go are pretty unusual to us now. But back in the Middle Ages, if you wanted that shorty and not to ruin your reputation, well, you're burping at the ceiling. Bro, I hope she's worth it. Next up is how love makes you crazy. This is a fascinating wormhole to travel down, and I learned from several journal articles that lovers in the Middle Ages had a real tendency to go mad. I mean, we all know the examples: Elaine, the fair maid of Astrolot, pining away; Romeo and Juliet, taking their lives; and the raving madness of Ophelia. But these are just dramatizations, right? We tend to regard accounts of love madness in medieval literature as evidence that they overestimated the strength of erotic passion. In classical and early medieval periods, sexual love was regarded as carnal appetite to be controlled. But with the rise of poetry sentiment and the theater came courtly love, which was seen as a highly spiritual desire. The idea of courtly love had more to do with the concept of loving rather than pleasure. This idealized kind of love was based on a secret union where two lovers could only love from far away. These sorts of unattainable relationships were increasingly romanticized, but in medieval society the notion that erotic love could drive people mad may not be so unrealistic. We understand now that mental illnesses are sometimes provoked by the stress between the individual and their social environment. Think of the pressure a woman had to marry. Her whole life is purely based on existing for marriage and childbirth. The headspace created would be incredibly vulnerable to valuing all self-worth off of said marriage. If she had no suitors or faces rejection and begins to start aging out of normal marrying age, these could be detrimental to her mind. Mental illness existed in the past. This level of self-worth being carried by societal pressure that also will punish a woman for her sexuality or existence of it should it be perceived as sinful or unwomanly is unbelievably stressful. So yeah, women primarily would literally be driven insane by marriage and their value being tied up in it. But it's okay to be crazy as long as you're hot, so let's follow these medieval beauty tips. These are actually documented tips I rounded up, so let's run through the list. First, pluck your eyebrows and move your hairline back. A high forehead was considered attractive. One hair removal recipe was a vinegar mixture with ant eggs and ivy. Yum! Second, cancel all your Mediterranean trips. You need to whiten your face. Paleness was considered beautiful, and to achieve this, some women would apply mixtures to their skin, such as white lead powder mixed with sheep's fat. Weird. Third, while you're at it, hide those birthmarks and moles with homemade concealer. These blemishes were sometimes associated with witches in the Middle Ages. You may know this from our top 10 unspeakable things women went through in the Dark Ages video. One popular concoction was a face mask of bulls or hares blood. Fourth, brunette is boring. 
boring. Go blonde with organic hair dye. Flaxen hair for women was considered the most beautiful. Women who were not blonde could try a hair dye made from stale sheep's urine and saffron. If word of mouth wasn't enough to get these beauty tips to you, rest assured. Daniel of Beckles wrote a popular 13th century etiquette book. Regarding appearance, he said a man's hair should be neatly styled with a beard that was neither long nor shaggy and nails should be attractive and teeth should be kept clean. How do you keep your teeth clean? One recipe for teeth cleaning in the middle ages was to mix sage leaves with salt, roll into balls, bake them into a powder and then rub them on the teeth. Sage advice indeed. And if you do not want to be a scandalous unmarried spinster, you better listen to it. And last but not least, don't forget to bring the hemlock. Whether you're two dirty knaves trying to get down lawlessly or a married couple who didn't want kids, hemlock was your best friend. So yes, while the medieval church made it clear that sex outside and for some clerics inside of marriage was sinful, the literary and documentary evidence suggests that these medieval Brits were still finding ways to be as randy as rabbits without an illegitimacy scandal. It was Hemlock, a recommendation made by 13th century author Peter of Spain in his book Treasure of the Poor. Peter wrote men should rub boiled paste of Hemlock on their boys before intercourse. Seeing as Hemlock is poisonous, this was ballsy. Obviously they were open to whatever suggestions they could get. When Persian physician Abba BMZ Razi works was translated, Europeans gobbled up his suggestions, which was applying cedar oil onto the nether regions before intercourse for a man or after for the woman. He also said that if the woman jumps backwards after intercourse, the uh, stuff will fall out. Seeing intercourse before marriage itself was illegal and knavery was perceived the way it was, I'm sure I don't need to explain the scandal in this one. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have here a C. Okay, I can admit when I'm wrong, and in the last video last week, I messed up. I said the wrong word when talking about spoiled queens. You guys pointed it out, yeah? I read your comments, okay? And now we're here to redeem ourselves. I'm learning, you're already smart, let's get into it. In medieval times, it could be dangerous to disagree. Nowadays, many people like to keep an open mind. There's so many cultures, beliefs, people think different things, and that is totally okay. But it absolutely was not okay in the Dark Ages, oh no. In these times, if you held any kind of belief that could go against the teaching of the Christian church, you were seen as a heretic. Many leaders, whether kings or crusaders or even missionaries and merchants, especially from the late 11th century, fought to have Christianity take over in the Mediterranean world. People belonging to other faiths, such as Jewish and Muslim people, suffered persecution and expulsion. In England, there were massacres, and in the late 12th century, Edward I banned all Jewish people from England. I mean, this quite literally set the stage for the Spanish Inquisition in 1478, which was aimed at establishing Spain as a united single. Christian faith. Wars in medieval Europe weren't just waged on people of different faiths, however, it was also aimed at some Christians who people believed to be heretics. This is all to say that heresy was a serious crime in these times, and thinking outside of what you were told to think at the time and what was accepted could have landed you a death sentence. Number 9. Facial Expressions I can't grow facial hair. I'm not sure if you noticed that watching, but it's never happened. It's not gonna happen, quite frankly. I don't have to worry about trimming a beard early in the morning, anything like that, which is fine, to be honest with you. I can't, I'm not really complaining. Back in the medieval ages, I would have been set. People would have been pretty, I don't know, would have been more than ideal. The no hair look was the way to do it. The forehead was seen as the central point of your face, so it was common back in the medieval times for individuals to pluck all of their eyelashes and remove their eyebrows completely. So people would just be looking at you like, nothing going on, no facial expressions, just bald everything. Many would go as far as to pluck their hairline back even further so they have the round, oval, queen bald look. Imagine that. Imagine everyone's bald in Game of Thrones. Think it'd still get the rankings that it does? Probably not. Probably not. Macy Williams is just... In our number 8 spot today, we have Animal Court. The history of animals being put on trial goes back pretty far, as it is believed it has roots in ancient Athens, but it was definitely a common practice as recently as the 18th century. Courts would go after things like rats, weevils, flies, locusts, and serpents for damaging crops, and when punished, they weren't just liable for damages, they could be banished and excommunicated. Like, imagine trying to banish a fly. This isn't where it ends though. In civil criminal court, they'd have livestock being tried for violence against humans. Like, I'm sorry, your honor, my client could not tell the prosecution that she didn't want to be milked because she's a cow. 
kicking was the only way. As an example of a real animal court case, let's take it back to 1457 France. Villagers in a town witnessed a sow and her six piglets attack and kill someone. Terrible story, sounds absolutely horrifying to have to witness. In this day and age, animal control would be called and all of those pigs would likely put down. But not in these times. When this happened, all the pigs were sent to court. Like real court. There was a judge, two prosecutors, eight witnesses, and a defense attorney for the accused animals. Witnesses provided testimony that proved that the sow had most definitely attacked the person and was definitely responsible for the crime. The piglets, however, well, for them, testimony was a bit murkier. There wasn't a witness who actually saw any of the piglets do any actual attacking. They just had blood on them, which isn't necessarily a sign of their guilt. It just means that they were there. This is why the court, while they did sentence the sow to death, the piglets were exonerated for their role in the crime. It's very strange and now would be a very expensive system, but in those times it really did work for them. Number 7. Inns and Taverns When we think of a medieval tavern or an inn, it's important to note the difference. Yes, there's drinking in both, and yes, both of them don't smell so great. But inns, their sole purpose was to house travelers comfortably, whereas a tavern not so much housing, more rough housing, if anything, if you catch my drift. Say you're passing by one of these taverns, right, Saturday night, you feel like grabbing some questionable ale from some questionable establishment, well, you better come prepared. In the Middle Ages, you had to bring your own fork everywhere you went. Just a single, just one fork on your side, on your person, that's so gross. We didn't have a guy sitting in booth 11 doing roll ups all night looking at you just wishing that he didn't work there, right? This was the middle ages, you didn't have a fork, no one had forks. If you had a fork, you were lucky, right? You were the rich kid on the block with an in-ground pool. That was you if you had a fork. Steak knives also were only reserved for carvers, so until the 17th century, you were just poking around your meal until you had a bite-sized amount, and then you would choke on it, because it's horrible. It's all chewy and horrible. In our number six spot today, we have the filth. If you lived in a city during this time in history, it would have been an absolutely filthy place to be. I mean, human and rats lived in harmony. Not harmony, re the plague. But things were so dirty, rats were everywhere. Want to go swimming in the nice stream nearby? Huh, well good luck, because not only is that body of water used for dumping sewage, but it's also for the village's water supply to both drink and bathe in. Disease was plentiful, obviously, and it spread exceptionally quickly. Spreading disease was even easier considering how all of the homes were packed full of people and no one really knew anything about hygiene and the benefits yet health and otherwise. If you were to go out in the evening, especially at past curfew, it was also an insanely huge risk. Going out ran you the risk of getting killed or robbed with no police on the streets to help protect you at all. While city living provided a bit of safety in numbers situation compared to the countryside and also provided more opportunities to make money, it was still quite a risky place to live during the dark ages. Number 5. Teeth worms. Awesome, you have any cavities? Now you're gonna be looking this whole video. Dentists weren't common back in the dark ages, but they did have a barber. So I guess we're good for a few hundred years. This guy did it all. Cavities, toothaches, teeth, worms, gross, you name it, he'll pull it out violently. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, bloodletting, your classic three-in-one appointment right there, really, all in 10 minutes or less. Instead of brushing with tooth tunes, back then you would rub your teeth and gums with a rough linen. Yeah, just grab an old shirt. It's an old dirty shirt. We're gonna brush up for school. Like you're playing a harmonica, only dirty shirt. A few recipes have been discovered since for pastes and powders to freshen their breath back then, you know. Otherwise, you were pretty screwed. You had nothing. We went from powdered charcoal to charcoal toothpaste all over again. What a weird loop we did. Mouthwashes were also made from herbs and spices steeped in wine or vinegar, so fresh breath guaranteed, no doubt about it. In our number four spot today, we have the stripes ban. We've all met someone before who seems to be concerned with what other people are wearing, and we jokingly refer to them as the fashion police. But back in the dark ages, you might come across some very real fashion police who are actually interested in finding you, should your finest tunic not be of the local dress code. Sometimes it wasn't even just a fine. Some serious fashion faux pas could lead to your imprisonment or even your death. Stripes were definitely a main culprit in these times, as striped clothing was seen as a garment of the devil. 
I'm not even exaggerating either. In the year 1310 in a French town, there was a local cobbler who was put to death because he had been caught in striped clothes. Yeah, we thought the tabloids were harsh, and I mean, they are, but the medieval fashion police were unforgiving. Not only were members of clergy not exempt from this rule, but neither were animals. Yeah, calling all zebras. Good luck out there, man. This is why zebras were called beasts of the devil. And yes, this is even though the people of Europe hadn't even seen them. Just heard tales of their striped nature. Number three, no rules football. In honor of the World Cup coming to a close, we have to take a look at football back in the late 12th century. Yeah, what did that look like? Or feel like, rather? Instead of corner kicks and throw-ins, you could do anything you wanted to retrieve the ball from the opposing team. Yeah, anything. Left hooks, some kicks, some jabs, throwing rocks, anything, you name it, it was violent. No diving in these games, I'll tell you that for free, you didn't have to. There was also no time limit. <clears throat> There was also no limit to how many players could be involved. So choose your team wisely. Pick the biggest guy, pretty much. It's town versus town a lot of the time. There's a lot of emotions out there settled on the field. And in the middle of it somewhere, there would be a soccer ball rolling around. I would call this a sport. Now finally, come 1314, King Edward II banned the game. And yeah, more than fair. Pause civilians and citizens are dying. He's like, yeah, maybe not. Maybe it's not wise. I don't know. In our number two spot today, we have fast medieval marriage. There are so many messed up medieval marriage practices. We could do an entire video on just that. And in fact, we have. Go check those out. But while you're here, let's talk just a bit about them. Marriage in the medieval times was quick and easy, but also difficult to prove. If you and your loved one wanted to get married, all you really needed to do was say, we're married, and then boom, it's done. Of course, this led to a whole pile of those spur of the moment type marriages, especially considering how sex before marriage was widely condemned in these times. You know, people are like, eh, it. We're married now, let's do it. Well, I'm pretty sure many people who were divorced would have preferred if their marriages were this easy. This led to people, of course, taking advantage of this difficult to prove thing. Most especially women would often fall victim to a man who might want to take you as his wife for the night. But then the following day, after getting what he wants, he denied ever agreeing to the union of the two. If you're catching my drift. This is why many women tried to get at least one witness to union, just in case. And finally, number one. Pointed shoes. This one's so fun. Whenever I see anything that's related to the medieval times, I always admire the attire, right? Especially the shoes. I hate buying shoes today so much. Now they're so specific. You got walking, running, trail shoes. They're always so expensive. Nobody does it like the medieval times anymore. Specifically, Krakows. Krakows were awesome. They were the style of shoe commonly worn in the 15th century Europe that looked really ridiculous. They had the long huge long nose that went up really high. They're so silly looking, maybe that's why I love them. These long-toed shoes first appeared in the 12th century, but the Krakow, the thing is, these things were twice as long as your foot, and that was considered fancy back then. These meant business, so you better watch those ankles, Beth, all right? We're going into some meetings fast. They were named after the city that they were made in. Krakows were worn by everybody at one point, but as cheeky as it sounds, the longer the shoe, the more valuable you were. There we go. So it turned into a joke eventually, right? These things got way too long and it looked ridiculous. You ever walk around in flippers beside the pool where you do that big silly walk? That's the walk that everybody was doing in town, right? It was out of hand. They would be stuffed with horse hair or moss. Yeah, which is just as comfortable as Dr. Scholl's. Imagine stepping around in moss all day. Yuck. Also, sometimes a string would be needed to be tied from the tip of the shoe to your knee just to keep these damn things afloat. So everybody at one point in time, in the medieval times, looked like a Muppet tied to strings. How amazing is that? Do you own any Krakows? If so, how do we get our hands on a pair? I'm a size 11 and a half Krakow. Let's make it happen. Maybe if we all pitch in as a community. I don't know, we can all be wearing Krakows tomorrow. Number 10, beauty sleep. When you go to bed at night, ideally you want eight hours. Me, personally, I'm lucky if I get like six. I don't know, I'm like a child. I'm restless at night. I'm kicking around, I'm making weird noises. It's insane, it's problematic. Maybe I should see someone. If this were medieval times, however, I'd be set. See, back in the dark ages, it was common to have two four hour naps at night rather than one swift eight hour slumber. See, many believe this was to tend to a fire or hopefully not a fire, you know? Gotta wake up, make sure things aren't gone. It's medieval times, it was rough. You wake up, throw a log on, yawn, and then hop back into your pile of hay. I don't know, whatever they had back then. Good times. This system of waking up after four hours, it sounds like an unhealthy inconvenience, but in reality, historical accounts suggest that people in the dark ages generally 
generally slept for longer periods of time, despite their sleep being interrupted by periods of wakefulness. They slept longer due to the fact that, you know, light bulbs didn't exist yet, so lava lamps weren't a thing, neither were alarm clocks. So people would often go to bed shortly after sunset and wake up with the sunrise, so that's a good rest. That's a good medieval rest. That's like 12 hours. Number nine, the Norse disappearance. I just watched the Norsemen. I'm gonna start barking at people now when I'm on the subway, just to, you know, get my old roots back, my old Norse roots. There are several theories regarding the disappearance of the Norse from Greenland during the Dark Ages, right? Where did they go? Where does a Norse Viking go? That's a little concerning. Where'd that guy go with the beard and the hatchet? That's a little important. One theory suggests that climate change played a significant role. The Little Ice Age, which began around the 14th century, that led to a decrease in temperature and a shorter growing season. Of course, making it difficult for the Norse to farm and raise livestock and, you know, have that big mighty beard and eat good. This could have resulted in a decline in food production, leading to famine and ultimately the collapse of Norse settlement. Another theory suggests that the North were on the North, the Norse, the North of the North. Another theory suggests that the Norse were unable to adapt to the harsh conditions of Greenland. The Norse were used to living in more temperate climates and the extreme conditions of Greenland could have been too difficult for them to endure. They're a little too hot for comfort. Finally, there's a theory that the Norse were driven out by the Inuit who had been migrating into Greenland around the same time as the North. So a little bit of a beef happened there, a little West Side Story with Vikings, if I may. The Inuit were skilled hunters and fishers, and their presence could have put pressure on the North Settlement, ergo war. But it's likely that the combination of these factors contributed to the disappearance of the North altogether. So exact reason, that's uh, still a mystery. I vote the Inuit though. There's probably some beef. There's probably some settlement beef. Number eight, green children of Woolpit. Now this one, this is a medieval story that tells the tale of two children who randomly appeared in the village of Woolpit in England, but they showed up with green skin and they spoke an unknown language. So aliens confirmed, for sure aliens. I wouldn't even open that door. The children were taken in by a nice local landowner. And although they were initially very distressed and refused to eat any human foods, they eventually adapted to their new surroundings. Again, green children didn't speak English, aliens. Reminder. The boy eventually learned to speak English over time and he explained that he and his sister came from a land where the sun does not shine and everything was green. Yeah, it's like Avatar 3 going on. Something's going on out there. Sometimes the grass is greener on the other side, but sometimes the people are also green. That's fun. That's a fun little bit. Bunch of incredible hooks in a place where there's no sun. Sounds nice and warm and welcoming. Lovely. Let's find out more. The origins of the story, of course, remain a mystery with various interpretations ranging from folklore to my personal favorite, extraterrestrial encounters. Love aliens. Love that. Grew up watching signs. You tell me in the comments. Did this happen? Are these aliens? Were these just random children? Children? This is all bullshit. Who knows? Number seven, Shroud of Turin. The origins of the Shroud of Turin, a piece of cloth that bears the image of a um, one Jesus Christ, a crucified man, shrouded in mystery, it seems. According to tradition, the shroud was used to wrap the body of, again, one Jesus Christ after his crucifixion, and many Christians believe this right here to be the burial cloth of Christ. I pointed like I actually have it here. I don't have it here. I wish I did. That would be great. We get a lot of likes, but no, it's over there. However, its authenticity is the subject of ongoing debate, of course, because... I mean, who really knows? The shroud first appeared in historical records in the 14th century, and it's been housed in Turin, Italy, since the late 16th century. Again, that's a pretty mighty piece of cloth right there. Next national treasure, Nicolas Cage has to grab that and put it in his pocket like a cowboy. Number six, John Cabot's fate. John Cabot, he was an Italian explorer who sailed under the English flag, and he's known for his voyages to North America in the late 15th century. His final voyage in 1497, this was intended to establish English trade and settlements in the New World. But Cabot, he set out with a small fleet of ships from Bristol, England, and he sailed along the eastern coast of North America. However, something happened. He encountered difficulties, I guess one could say, including rough weather and a mutiny among his crew, which is much worse than a storm, I would say. And his fate remains unknown to this day. That rhymed, Dr. Seuss, love it. Some historians believe that Cabot may have perished at sea, while others speculate that he may have made it back to England and then died there. So how did he go? Was he eaten? Who knows? Who really knows? Number five. Five, the plague. Yes, we just lived through one of these. That's in the, isn't that neat? Can't wait to tell my kids about that one. Plagues are everywhere throughout history. Some are short, some are impossibly incredibly long. The bubonic plague arrived to medieval England in 1348. Now the death toll here, it was devastating. I mean, we put up some crazy numbers in the last few years, don't get me wrong, but in the dark ages, the bubonic plague took out almost half of England's population. That's insane. They didn't even have Uber back then. You're like, how? How did that happen? Back then, the plague was a bacterium now known as your 
and he had pastus. Symptoms were jarring to say the least. There were lumps in the armpits and or um, you know groin area. Not fun. Black spots would appear all over your body. It was uncomfortable and it was noticeable definitely to say the least that you were plagued out. Almost all that were infected died within three days. More often than not without a fever. Just randomly. Boom. Done. The drop in the population resulted in a widespread of wealth. That's uh, I guess a bright side. Not really. Workers were demanding higher wages. Farmers were demanding lower rents and the poor got expendable income. Sounds a little familiar, dare I say. Number four, Greek fire. This one's absolutely crazy. Greek fire was a weapon used in medieval times. It was particularly used by the Byzantine Empire and it was known for its ability to burn even when submerged in water. Yeah, almost like magic, some would say. Some scary hot magic. The composition of Greek fire was a closely guarded secret, but it was known to be a highly flammable liquid that could be projected from tubes onto enemy ships or soldiers. So yeah, they would just blast liquid lava at you. And then they're like, yeah, war's done. Just like that. Like in Game of Thrones where it's just green fire. It was kind of like that. Greek fire was often used in naval battles and set enemy ships ablaze in four minutes or less. And its use was a significant factor in the success of the Byzantine Navy. The exact ingredients and recipe for Greek fire, like I said, they have been lost to history. And its composition remains a subject of debate and speculation among historians. Let's hope we don't find this one. I don't know. Let's find some pharaohs, mummies, tombs, treasures. That's great. Some guy's like, oh, the recipe for liquid lava that we can shoot at people. Awesome. Let's do it. Number three, the Vinland map. Map. The Vinland map, this one's fun to all the toptographers, topographers, toptographers, map people. This one's for all the map fans out there. The Vinland map is a medieval map that depicts parts of North America, including a region known as Vinland. Not to be confused with Vineland, that's pretty good, I, that's a fun one. Vinland is believed to have been visited by the Norse explorer Leif Erikson around the year 1000. Now the map was first discovered in the 1950s and it's believed to date back to the 15th century. Buster rhymes, I'm like, huh? However, its authenticity has been the subject of ongoing debate among scholars and historians because, you know, it's like Atlantis. Some have argued that the map is a forgery while others believe that it's a genuine medieval artifact like the Shroud of Turin with, you know, Jesus's selfie. This is amazing. I have to say I believe this was once a real place. Sure, why not? The amount of pharaohs and leaders, dictators, all these people throughout history lost in books that have been burnt. Of course there are places and maps that have also been lost to history. Or maybe I've watched too many national treasure movies. Could be, could be the latter. It's probably that too. Number two, the dancing plague. Alright, this one's fun. Hit that like for step up two fans. It's gonna be real sick. July 15, 18, one of the most bizarre dance circle slash plague events, who knows really, in medieval history went down. It was the craziest dance circle all of history, I have to have to admit. The dancing plague. Yeah, why can't this be the plague that comes back now? Why it had to be the one that was gross, everyone's coughing on each other. Why could we all just be popping and locking in the streets in 2020? Would have been way better. The town of Strasbourg was calm, cool, and collect one summer back in 1518 until out of nowhere, one woman began to dance or convulse uncontrollably in the streets. Others soon joined her, which is the weird part, and eventually over 400 people were all dancing the days away or convulsing, one of the two. It's really tragic. See, this was not a good time. It's, you know, we call it the dancing plague. Like, oh, they were all dancing in the street. No, it was a nightmare. People are like seizing on the ground. Seizing? Seizing? People are seizing on the ground. It was tragic. A good amount lost their lives due to pure exhaustion alone. The authorities, they tried their best to help out the situation. They uh, they paid for musicians to perform for them while they convulsed, which is just the thing you need back then. They're like, oh my god, what's happening? Quick. They just played music. They're like, this makes it way better. This is so fun now. No, it was horrible. Everyone was sick. This was a disease. This happened a few times in Europe, believe it or not, between the 14th and 17th centuries, and we still don't know what exactly happened. All we know is that it was some sort of illness and that it was not like step up two. Apparently it was not sick, nor 3D, nothing like that. And finally, number one, no insults. This one here is great. This would change the game today. If we brought this one back, so good. I can't whistle, but. It'd be like that. If you hurled insults at somebody back in medieval times, they were entitled to compensation and they could summon everyone else who's around at the time to be a witness. Yeah, if you spoke bad of someone during the Viking Age, even if the person wasn't there, it could ruin their reputation. And because of that fact, you now need to pay them for the possible damages you caused with your words, with your sick, nasty words. It doesn't even matter if the insult was true either. Your reputation was how you gained employment back then, how you met friends, and it was really important. It was an important thing not to be messed 
tasked with. Also, if you insulted one man, apparently you insulted his entire family as well. So it's like that Vin Diesel kind of Fast and Furious families everything vibe where with one person, they're all coming at you. It was rough. There were some words, however, where a man would be allowed to kill you if you said it. I don't even want to know which words that was. Sometimes you went a little too far spreading lies, so they had to make it a capital punishment. Now, thou shall not talk smack. Get out of here. Rome really had existed as nothing but a name by the time the empire falls on September 4th of 476, having been falling inwards on itself for just short of a century at that point. So started the periods between the 5th and the 15th centuries known as the Middle Ages. This time can be split into three main sections, the Early Middle Ages, aka the Dark Ages, High Middle Ages, and Late Middle Ages. One of the most famous events from the entirety of the Middle Era was truly kicking some ass in the Dark Ages, and it was the Black Death. Something that nobody gets anymore, with exception for a cool 20,000 some odd people between 2000 and 2009, and 56 people in the United States in the last few years. But if we pretend that we don't know that, and if we can avoid chipmunks like the effing plaid carrying hairbringers of death they are, then we most likely don't have to worry. But travel back in time, say to the 800s or even 1340s Europe, and your chances of surviving are somewhere between 7 and 10 and 2 and 5. Black Death killed as much as 60% of the entire population of Europe. So when you're at work looking around, but with those blank dead fish eyes, bored, cross off every third person you see in a pattern of five and try to figure out how many of them are gone and who you'd manage without. Probably now, being in a position to go, hey boss, looks like you need new middle management team, and ain't since nobody left, hooray, promotion. That's exactly what happened in the Middle Ages too, after half the world died, kind of changed the balance of power. Suddenly peasants could ask for pay raises and improvements in working conditions and life got a little better for them. This was further developed by the evolution of feudalism. And as a result, the first banks and widespread money supply appeared for the first time in Europe. RIP freedom, hello capitalism. And speaking of the workforce, how about their dirty jobs? Knight, tosher, rat catcher, oh my, there's no shortage of terrible jobs in the dark ages. So let's cover a few. So a leech collector was a woman's role. She was often living in the countryside near marshes and bogs, just generally dirty open water spots where she could strip her legs bare, grab a bucket, and wade into the mud, waiting for leeches to sucker themselves on. At that point, she could scrape the buggers off, bucket them, and then sell them in town to physicians, the wealthy people, beauty stores, whatever. Enjoy the scabs and infectious diseases. The groom of the stool was a position for the royal household, who was in charge of cleaning the king's badunkadunk, making sure it was clean and dry post his kingly, well, dumps. Tanning leather seems like it would just be hard. Don't worry, on top of stripping animal skin of its fur, soaking it, and consequently yourself in lots of lime and salt, it also involved animal feces. See, you'd hire this other guy who somehow had a worse job than you, he's called a pure collector. He'd collect you dog poop, you'd grab it with your bare hands and mush it into leather to treat it. And don't get started on lime burners or treadmill operators, which was essentially a 50-50 death sentence job. And usually whatever job you ended up with was one for life, because chances are you stay in one place. Many people dream of traveling. My generation especially is one that's opting out of children in order to do so. This isn't new and the human desire to travel and learn is something inherent, coming with curiosity and the need to discover. But this wasn't one of those times. Written records show that a sizable proportion of people not only didn't travel to other countries, they never even left their region or the village they were born in. Even if you did manage to travel, it wasn't planes and annoying but passable airport waits. The average traveler would often sleep out in the open air. Inns or other forms of accommodation were few and far between, and usually too expensive for the typical person to afford. So aside from the super fun chance of freezing to death overnight, travelers in the Middle Ages also had to worry about being robbed or attacked on the road. Many people therefore chose to travel in groups, but even then you weren't entirely safe. Your homies could turn on you at any second. Consider also that roads and pathways were rough, and this was a ridiculous era where even spraining an ankle could prove to be fatal. Then there's finally bridges, which are quite rare, especially outside of big cities. So so you might have to cross rivers manually, and while they could memorize and recite Latin every day, these dummies couldn't swim. Drowning was all too commonplace, even the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick I died while attempting to cross a river. So if you're gonna live in one region, one city, and one house your whole life, naturally it would be a dingy shack. Because peasants' homes were small, often just made up of one room. They were constructed of wattle and daub, a type of method of constructing walls, in which vertical wooden stakes, or wattles, are woven with horizontal twigs and branches, and then daubed with clay or mud. Then they'd have a thatched roof to boot. And if they're well constructed, these bad boys could be waterproof and stand for a decent amount of time. But they required upkeep, and not everyone can afford that, especially seeing as it's essentially paper mache twigs and mud, you really had to stay on top of this. Inside of a hut, a third of the air 
area was penned off for animals which lived inside with the family. I know people that complain about the smell of a cat litter box. My guy, you could have had a whole donkey living next to the kitchen sink. Chickens, cows, pigs. Then to really complement the mildew smell of rotting roof and the stink of sweat and feces covered animals, a fire burned in the hearth in the center of the hut so that the air was permanently eye watery smoky. Furniture was maybe a couple stools, a trunk and bedding, and a few cooking pots. Beds were a thing, but they weren't very great. And don't forget a couple of dirty chamber pots kicking around the room. We may have discovered a new homing style, you guys. We could call it medieval open conceptualism with minimalism aesthetic. And when it's time to get your kid out of the house, you hook them up with an apprenticeship. The freaky Greekies weren't the only ones tossing their kids at other adults saying, here, take this and raise it. However, unlike the Greek apprenticeship, which came with some strings attached, as explained in the recent top 10 reasons why living in ancient Greece was impossible video, the Dark Age apprenticeship was truly and solely about work, but nobody said it was good or fair work. From the midpoint of the Middle Ages onward, master craftsmen were permitted to employ youngsters for free so long as they provided them with food, lodging, and formal training in their specific craft, which would undoubtedly elevate their status in this society. But getting through an apprenticeship was hard as hell. First, nobody said the food had to be quality, so rations often sucked and apprentices could effectively starve. But then there was the fact you could just get beat up by your master at any time, because it was literally expected of them to do that. Why? Because apprenticeships were ways of parents to get crappy, troublesome teens out of the house and learn some discipline in society. To add insult to injury, apprentices were stuck between childhood and adulthood by being teens. Because on one hand, a teen in medieval times would have been treated as an adult. On the other hand, privileges of adulthood, like the right to inherit money or ownership of land, didn't come into play until around age 21. So you're expected to be an adult, treated like a kid. Small wonder then that the tales of apprentices misbehaving badly are a staple of written accounts from the Middle Ages. Rather than dedicating themselves to their professional development, apprentices would often be found in pubs and brothels. Normal middle aged teen activity. And having a crappy kid sucks even more so back then than now because of the baby gamble. Choosing, if a woman got to choose, to have a baby was a hell of a decision in the dark ages. Plagues, famines, messed up weather, just not the environment for it. Let alone women being regarded as morally weak and they weren't allowed to do things that modern women take for granted, like getting a job, deciding who to marry, having opinions, wearing pants. Your only two options were to become a nun or marriage. No work, no single living in the country, you get two options. And even if you weren't the most devoutedly religious, none was safer, if not a better option. Childbirth and pregnancies would kill one out of every three women in the dark ages. Compare that to today's maternity morality rate as one out of every 0.028% of women. The fact that the female population now is significantly more equal in numbers to men in comparison, I think the choice is spectacularly easy. According to the Raven Report, childbirth in the Middle Ages and the Tudor period were so dangerous, royal women were encouraged to write out their last will and testament well in advance to giving birth. Just imagine adding that to the baby to-do list under decorate nursery and sew onesies. But on the flip side, some men weren't exactly capable of popping out babies, thus the impotence trials. Modern time has counseling, understanding doctors, and little blue pills. All sorts of resources to help men with that issue. But the Middle Ages? Whew, don't expect any real sympathy, not from wives or the whole community. Conjugal duties are taken hella seriously, partially because everyone was frisky and they're locked into having just one person for the rest of their life. And it wasn't just men who had the right to ask their partners to perform. Wives could also demand intimacy and failure to provide, well, buddy, you're getting served. And many recorded cases of women being granted divorce due to their husband's infancy exist to prove it. And they were carried out in public. Whole Judge Judy style throwdowns to called impacy trials where accused man was expected to um, perform in front of the jury. To be granted a divorce, the woman had to prove her man was unable to perform, which wouldn't be shocking when you have an entire village watching with bated breath, even if it wasn't an issue before. Don't worry, a dude could save himself the shame of an annulment by calling on special witnesses such as working girls or other women from the past who could attest his manly prowess. Any medieval lady capable of putting her husband through such a humiliating ritual was almost always from a wealthy family. Lawyers and expert physicians didn't come cheap, but at the end of the day, men were literally able to cut our faces off in public or throw us in a fire alive for not baking bread rice. So guys, I don't really think you can complain about this too much. Laws like this are one of the many stupid details that could have you randomly imprisoned. Another one, stingy stripes. Living in the dark ages is impossible for a lot of reasons, but having to keep track of hundreds of stingy laws to ensure you don't get locked up over a mistake truly was one of the hardest factors. What was the wrong way to pray? The wrong hair? A mole in the wrong spot? A color only the king can wear? Or how the simple act of wearing stripes could lead to your 
imprisonment, or even death. Why? Because for some reason, striped clothing were seen as a garment of the devil. Thus, anyone caught wearing them would at best get an evil eye from people in the street, or at worst, get a hemp necktie. From the year 1250 onwards, the only people who were caught wearing stripes were the lowest of the low in society. Working girls, handicapped, the ill, the orphaned. They would don striped outfits, highlighting their status as outsiders. In 1295, Pope Boniface issued a papal decree banning religious orders from wearing any type of striped clothing. In the year 1310, in the French town of Rouen, for example, a local cobbler was condemned to death simply because he had been caught wearing striped clothes. Crazily, even animals weren't exempt. Records show that zebras were called beasts of the devil, even though people in Europe had only ever heard reports of them and hadn't even seen one with their own eyes. You can see how these guys led to colonization, right? Ridiculous. With the dawn of the Enlightenment in Europe, the hatred of stripes eased and eventually disappeared, and many look on the phenomenon with confusion, and understandably so. Time for the Shrek references. It's ogres and pitchforks. More specifically, just the pitchforks, and less specifically, really just the farm tools in general. You guys know in the movies like Shrek when the villagers all come carrying pitchforks and farm tools and of all things, like why that and not swords? First of all, swords are heavy, and who has that kicking around? Seriously. Secondly, noblemen could require all male peasants over the age of 18 to report for military service. Didn't matter if it was a justified war against a viable external threat or just a petty fight against a local rival. If you are called up for duty, you had to report. According to histories of the time, around one in five peasant men would be in a military service. Food and clean water were in short supply and disease was rife. Some historians reckon two thirds of all conscripted men who died were killed by unsanitary conditions of their own camps over any enemy action. But peasants were required to bring their own weapons. Moreover, they would rarely receive anything more than rudimentary training, so they're sent to war unprepared and ill-equipped. Thus the thought process, well if this tool works on my farm, for this it'll work for that. So uh, what really sucked about military service in medieval times is how little was in for it for you. These days joining the military can be a way of learning a trade or generally improving your lot in life. Not so back then. Feudal lords were fearful of their peasants getting too powerful. So you're once a farmer, you're staying one. If a peasant soldier got too skillful on the field of battle, there were several cases of them ending up mysteriously dead. It's like getting a journalist of the year award from the CIA. And finally, it wasn't just living that was impossible, but death sucked too. Alright, so evidently, whether from this video, others, or general universal knowledge, Dark Ages was pretty grim reality to live in. It's short, dirty, desolate, and brutal. But when it wasn't short, it was somehow worse. See, anyone over the age of 50, which was a crazy age achievement at the time, was deemed elderly. Unlike other cultures existing at the time, elderly in Europe are not even close to revered or respected. You didn't get to retire, having to pay your own way and continuing to work until physically you simply couldn't. Then, yeah, after that, you're really just a burden. Your own kids are side eyeing you, and everyone's asking you why haven't you haven't died yet? What's the big hold up here, guys? For many, death was the only real chance to escape from everyday hardships or working the fields and trying to get enough money and food to survive. And when that finally happens, and you pass through and rejoin the energies of our Earth, you will finally find your peace. Yeah, no, psych. That still didn't happen. According to some research in Europe during the Middle Ages, mass of 40% of graves were disturbed. Now, this wasn't like grave robbing during the Enlightenment. There were no university medical schools paying good money for fresh corpses to study. Rather, most cases of grave disturbances were run-of-the-mill theft. Often people would be buried with a small selection of their possessions, perhaps a favorite cup, a locket, a stuffed animal toy, or other such trinkets. In tough times, even some dead person's mystery grave junk might be enough to tempt a broke thief to dig someone up. However, this wasn't always the case. There's some even weirder crap, too. Archaeologists in England have found evidence to suggest that in dozens upon dozens of quote grave robbing cases, rather than looking for objects, those responsible bound and gagged the dead bodies and then left them like that. It seems like they're fearful of restless souls, or perhaps of the undead rising again. Who knows, they had a lot of problems back then. Things Harry and how the French royalty all aspired to cosplay Rapunzel. A tale originating from 6th century Paris, France is about two princes who were going to ascend to the throne. They were kidnapped and the queen consort was given the choice, allow her grandson's hair to be cut 
or let them die with their luscious locks intact. She chose the sword over the scissors. One of the princes does manage to escape and he cuts his own hair and becomes a monk. In modern times, saying all right, kill him instead of a haircut does sound crazy, but back then men who had long hair showed their power and wealth. According to the Byzantine poet historian Agathias, it is the rule for Frankish kings to never be shorn. Indeed, their hair is never cut from childhood on and hangs in abundance on their shoulders. Their subjects have their hair cut round and are not permitted to grow it further. In Germany, men also typically wore their hair long, but they would tie it up in a bun or on the top of their head and sometimes hide it under a fancy hat. In general, dark ages were a time where women did rarely cut their hair and there wasn't really any time period where short hair for women was trendy then. Lower class women typically wore their hair up in braids and buns because it was easier for them to work with, while upper class women got to style their hair with more intricate processes, using ribbons and metallic wires to help keep their braids and buns in place, like a Leia. On the other end of the spectrum, however, bold is punishment. To address why the grandmother would allow her grandson's death before a haircut, in today's world men shave their heads for all sorts of reasons. They could be naturally losing their hairline, have alopecia, or they're just prone to hair loss. However, in medieval times, hair was considered a symbol of power for royal men, as explained. Royal men never cut their hair, so the longer the locks, more powerful you're supposed to be. So as a man, if you let go of your hair, this was a huge sign of humility. If the grandsons from the first story had returned with shorn hair but are meant to be the throne's heirs, they would make the throne look weak and susceptible. Only monks would shave their heads, leaving a narrow strip of hair horizontally around. Other times, only in the middle of a man's head was shaved and the rest was left alone. And of course, as you may know well from our other Dark Age videos, head shaving for women during this time was a degrading punishment as a woman's long hair was meant to be her most seductive feature. We talked about one type of head hair, let's travel down to the other, bearded baddies. Recently, beards have made a huge comeback, especially now among the young generations thanks to throwback fashion. Studies have shown that people also associate a man with a beard as being more intelligent and many people find them to be incredibly attractive. Also, nothing is cooler than the giant dude with the bald head and like the big ass beard, you know, let's be real. Respect for beards though is nothing new. During medieval times, knights were known to grow their beards as a sign of honor and if one man touched another man's sign of honor, well, it was enough of an insult to challenge them to a duel to the death. Now, shaving was common during the Middle Ages. Commoners would be clean shaven for the most part. Royalty was also usually shaven or had a very trim beard that was kept neat and tidy. Hilariously, however, this is kind of how barbers get started. Back in medieval times, mirrors were very small and cloudy, so they're not reliable. They were also only available to the upper class. On top of that, razors as we know them today didn't exist, so if you want to shave, you need to use one of those dangerously long razor blades. So most folks would visit the local barber surgeon for a Sweeney Todd style lineup. As we mentioned earlier, monks had shaved heads and no beards, so they took turns shaving one another as a community. And speaking of faces, the Dark Ages were surprisingly skincare obsessed. Vikings are remembered as some of the most hygienic of historical people, and they were reported to have the best practices of personal hygiene in the early Middle Ages especially. Most notable was the near daily bathing they did in the cold waters of fjords and rivers. They used combs made out of ivory or innate wood carvings, and they practiced braiding their hair for prestige and ranking. The daily practice of bathing and personal hygiene actually was what spared the king of Poland from an outbreak of plagues that had been seen in Europe. Meanwhile, in England, bathing was not as common as it is today and it was often reserved for special occasions. People would usually wash their hands and faces regularly, however. The ideal woman in the Middle Ages had that pale, smooth skin without any pockmarks or blemishes. Nearly everyone washed their face with cold water at the end of the day, even if they wouldn't wash the rest of themselves for inexplicable amounts of time. Some women used ointments made of animal fat in order to keep skin soft and smooth. And crystal girlies, even back then, people believed in the power of gemstones to heal. Women would lick amethyst and rub it over their pimples to make it go away. But rest assured, when it's bath time, you were naked in a crowd. In many middle age cultures, public bathing was commonplace. The Romans, Egyptians, Greeks, they were especially known for their bath houses. And in the spring and summer, commoners could be spotted using streams and rivers to take a bath on a nice warm day. Back then, this wasn't seen as being indecent or strange. Water was scarce, and the process of heating a bath was time consuming and expensive. So it was also common to share bath water among a lot of people and be less wasteful. However, people are still humans after all, so like teens at a pool party, public bathing became associated with a certain level of sensuality. 
Seeing as this was a time period where intercourse was usually in hearing or seeing range of your imminent direct family, it's not a surprise this happened, let alone the fact nobody actually cared if it was. Well, except the church. They threw a bunch of laws around to try and limit that crap, but that's always what they've done. Anywho, in Japan, they still continue the tradition of public bathing in hot springs to this day. However, they have the option to segregate when men from women, so it's not as often that people leave the public bathhouse to hook up nowadays. Not to get you guys too excited either, but face washing brought in controversial hand washing. Contrary to popular belief, some groups of the medieval Evil people actually wash their hands multiple times a day. Jewish people in particular made sure to wash their hands before eating, and Christians adopted the same practice. But even unreligious peoples would sometimes wash their hands after eating, since a lot of people didn't own utensils, and wiping your hands on fabric ain't always gonna do it. Case in point, honey garlic wings. In upper class families, guests specifically were always requested to wash their hands by pouring water out of a pitcher called an aquamanil, which was poured over a basin. These aquamanils were often in the shape of lawn or people or mythical creatures. However, no one was washing to the extent of using soap for 20 seconds. The water in these small pitchers needed to be shared among a large group of people. So people in the Middle Ages simply splashed water on their hands before drying and poured the dirty water right back in to wash someone else's fingers later. But you'd think that soap would be involved, especially because endless people essentially had a dark age Etsy store. Today, soap is made out of essentially the same products every time. Back in the Middle Ages though, people used a lot of different substances in a cold like witches making a potion just trying to produce some semblance of soapy stuff that don't smell bad. Most successful was a combination of lime, wood ash, lard and oil. Black soap, aka soft soap, gets its name from the dark color of the wood ash lye used to make it, and the cast iron it was often boiled in. Hard soap was made with high quality barilla ashes, which creates a light colored lye. Therefore, white soap quickly became equated with high quality hard soap. The stiff soap was then molded into cakes and bars, added dried flowers to the outer side, and the quality and scent of the soap changes depending on how wealthy someone is. Unfortunately, Casey didn't catch the keyword in there a few times, folks made soap with lye, which is so harsh it can remove skin if you scrub a little too hard. Next is how the world could have had toilet paper faster if they weren't judgy wipers. China had toilet paper figured out as early as the 6th century, making small squares of rice paper that would decompose into the ground and take the feces with it. Pretty eco-friendly stuff. However, the Europeans found this to be horrifying because they thought it was disgusting that the Chinese only wiped without actually washing their backside with water. Me Meanwhile, in Europe, they're using a communal sponge on a stick that sat in a bucket of water that wouldn't be changed all day, so please tell me which is more unsanitary and horrifying. In medieval Europe, people sometimes used devices called gonfus, or a gonf stick, as well as a torchicool, or a torch cut. The gonf sticks were sponges on a stick as described, while the torchicool was anything to wipe the bottom. Like straw, or moss, or leaves, or wood. You know, the basics. Who has time to care about eye bags, though? when you're walking around wearing a gag preventer nose bag. Even though medieval people clean their bodies a, a little bit more than you'd imagine, that doesn't mean the towns were sparkling clean. When you stepped outside, you came face to face with human waste, rotting food, and trash riddled streets. Horses regularly relieved themselves on the street, as did the live animals in the markets, and so did the people. Also, animals just kind of died in places and people would leave them there. Add in the smell of mold from straw houses and the smell of diseased human or animal skin, and sometimes even corpses, these bad smells were at their worst in cities and large towns. Things were so incredibly smelly, people nearly gagged, especially when it all began to bake under the hot summer sun and heat. So in order to combat the smell, some people wore nose bags, which were fabric-like masks that were filled with flowers and other fragrances that would be able to help the stomach smell the streets filled with waste. Men and women would put noses in the nose bag, give them a huff, and life is good again. The lesson here, be thankful for breeze and use it. And of course, the weirdest for last, the ear spoon. Sounds promising, doesn't it? While nowadays people use q-tips to clean your ears, which apparently we aren't even supposed to be doing, as cringeworthy as it sounds, people use long wooden or metal spoons called ear spoons or ear picks to remove the wax. Ear picks were also frequently made of bone, ivory, and brass as purely utilitarian items. Archaeologists have found them amongst the Vikings primarily, where it was common for them to carry an ear spoon on a chain around their neck so that they never have to be without their little tool should they ever have to degunk themselves. Ear spoons were used by all levels of society in medieval and post-medieval England following the Tudors. The 17th century English knew about plaque, which they called scale, and they were encouraged by their doctors to scrape their teeth frequently. So these 
little doodads expanded to include that purpose. And how could I not mention that while a tailor normally would use beeswax to coat thread and make it stronger and easier to use, with no bees available, earwax would do. As gross as it may seem to us today, earwax was worth saving and selling. All right, let's get going with how you're weird for drinking water. Because it's actually not true that water wasn't drinkable, just that people tended to get sick from drinking still water and they knew it. And they knew boiling said still water would make it drinkable, the way that spring water and natural well water were. People prefer to drink cold water rather than hot, and there was the paranoia that if the water cooled back down, it would become unsafe to drink again. So an alternative was to make something out of it if you don't want to drink hot water all season long. Thus beer. The end product of the boiled barley mix would endure storage for weeks or months, its taste would improve with time, and it was better than drinking steamy hot water all day. Two batches would be produced from the same mash. The first was a full strength beer, the second was lower in alcohol, and that was consumed more throughout the day while working or when you're just thirsty. So yes, while water was available, beer still was the bev of choice. People thought that you were either a nutcase or just highly devout religious if water was your go-to. One account by the Gallo Roman historian Saint Gregory mentions a boy so religious he primarily drank water. Ooh, shocking. Our next title is all about titles because the medieval, middle, whatever ages were all about titles more so than any other time in European history. Think about it. I mean, they literally called the system feudalism because of the constant feuding between higher titles. Kings delegated power among their trusted subordinates. So dukes are under kings and they rule duchies, counts are under them and they rule counties. The clergy's under them and they rule religious institutions, the mayors are under them and they rule cities, and then the aldermen are under those guys and they rule the villages. These rulers and other wealthy landowners make up the nobility. Below the nobility are the typical citizens, and below them are the serfs, the ones who are hard laborers indebted to nobles. Nowadays you can come from a small slum town and work your way up to Hollywood fame just using an iPhone and a ring light. Back then, if you were alderman rank or below, there is not much hope for you. You're locked into your social status for life. A lot of us are probably feeling cocky, feeling like that's survivable. You forget the entitlement you have in your day to day lives. Because living back then, everything is a debt. Ah, you may be wondering, Teresa, how is that any different from now? Society's crumbling, inflation has destroyed the young generations. Well, let me tell you how status and debt in medieval times was just as much if not more of a prison than nowadays digital credit system. So now that you understand the system of titles, back to the average Joe, the peasant. Chances are you're a farmer, but you don't have any tools and you don't own the land either, the nobles have both the tools and the land. In order to actually farm, you gotta go to your local noble and he gives you the land and tools in exchange, you give him a portion of your crops. Usually this is about 50 to 75% of what you grow, so if you grow about an acre of crops, you have just enough to feed yourself and your family and pay the noble. Now if you choose this life, which you will if you want to survive, you're going to miss a couple of payments to said noble, putting you in debt to him, thus a serf. Meanwhile, your local duke wants to raise an army to conquer the neighboring Duke's land. He has to get the approval of the counts under him, and the counts have to get the approval of the landowners. This is because, like you, the landowners don't actually own the land. Their Duke does. The Duke doesn't own the land either. The King does. The landowner sends some of the crops he takes from you to the Duke already, but now he has another responsibility for him. He has to raise his army. Can you guess where this army comes from? That's right, it's you. Welcome to paying a debt with your life. But don't worry, being in battle isn't all bad. Look at why they invented chivalry. In 21st century, the word chivalry evokes a kind of old fashioned male respect for women. But in early middle ages, church councils were literally praying to be delivered from knights. And by the late 11th century, early 12th, it was decided they straight up needed laws to govern these guys. Knights were essentially hired thugs dressed in tin cans on horses and were commanded by warlords after all. How great do you expect them to be? They were rewarded with land or the license to plunder the villages Game of Thrones style, looting, forcing themselves on women killing the innocent, burning it down. But a lot of the time they didn't wait for that to be rewarded. Knights were known to terrorize villages and towns they came across as if they were bandits. For example, in 1379 Sir John Ardendell rode to a covenant and asked the nuns to put him up for a few nights. After they agreed, he and his armed men looted the nunnery, stormed a nearby church, stole a newly married bride, forced themselves upon her, kidnapped the nuns, take them out to sea, and throw everybody overboard. At a time where routine night violence and with massive citizen casualties were happening, chivalry was an effort to set ground rules for knightly behavior. While these rules sometimes dictated generous treatment of the less fortunate, they were focused mainly on protecting the interests of the elite. Hope you're one of those, otherwise you might uh, die because a sociopath on a horse is bored. 
And now for the vast nothingness. There was nobody for miles. From childhood as far as your eyes can see outside of your house, other houses, and about 200 people, there is nothing. Just nothing. You lived and died seeing the same thing every day with only a few excuses to travel out into the world. In 1086, there were 1 million people living in all of England compared with the 53 million today. By the 1300s, this had climbed to 4 mil, but the Black Death wiped out about 1.5 mil of those people between 1348 and 1350, meaning many villages were completely decimated or just abandoned. Traveling parties in medieval Europe were not exactly rolling in options for transportation means when it came time to travel. Horses, carts, human feet. And that last one was by far the most common. There were a lot of reasons why even the average peasant may travel. In England between 600 AD and 1485, these included going to mass because early villages didn't really have their own churches. Or attendance at the local court, which was compulsory for all free men once a month. Payments of taxes to the royal manor four times a year. But just short of going to the neighboring big town, most never really left their homes or their home community. Women especially, they weren't seen to have much purpose outside of their front door. On a lighter note, pigs in your blanket. No, not in a, uh, in yours. Because when you live in a mud and straw hut that is 100% full of humidity and would absorb every smell ever brought into it, including that of the family beer bucket, what you want to do is add an animal pen to that and a loosely made roaring fire in the middle of the room. There were a number of home designs revolving around a single room first floor with a fence or other partial barrier dividing it. Animals were kept on one side of the barrier, humans lived on the other. This kept the animals body heat inside the house, marginally adding to the indoor temperatures during the cold season and providing literal hell during the summer ones. But I mean, hey, you could always let them wander loosely outside. But weren't medieval houses like super tiny? <laughs> Correct, but so were the medieval farm animals. Homies were undernourished and so small that a full grown bull was around the size of a modern calf and sheep were only a third of the size that they are now today. Modern sheep yield around 7.3 pounds of wool. Medieval fleece yield was something less than one pound per animal. And speaking of, let's segue into how all your food was dry. We sure, we can't truly know if medieval food was bad because nowadays we're spoiled. We have spice and garlic and proper cooking abilities. They had some meat, some grains, some vegetables, and a figure the F out mentality. As a result, we're gonna be more grossed out or picky with their food, but if we experienced it from their perspective without having tasted the food we've tasted now, it probably wouldn't be half bad. But hell would it be dry. Just so dry. That's the one thing I don't think any of us could survive, even with perspective. In the medieval period, meats and breads were kept well stored by drying them. Meat specifically was salted, then dried. Bread at the time wasn't made with yeast, so it tended to be flatter and it didn't mold it would just go harder with time. Let's do some comparison. Here's the meat of the medieval period compared with some modern day beef jerky, the closest thing. Even our dried meat of the 21st century is juicier than the medieval version and probably wouldn't be the usual jaw workout. Now for bread, here's some medieval bread and here's some modern day bread of similar composition. See how medieval bread is a lot more enclosed and sturdier than modern bread? Looks like if you needed a spare tire, you could drill a hole in this bad boy, toss her on the frame. Medieval food was meant to last. And sometimes making things like these breads and meats were the family business. You may have seen the recent 10 reasons why living in ancient Egypt was impossible video, in which case you'd know that it was a custom of the times and place for a father to determine the career of his son. This ideology was shared in a few other places, ancient China, Greece, and medieval England apparently, where the trades were usually passed from generation to generation. Commoners in the middle ages worked where they lived, consequently it made it easier for their trade to be passed down from father through son through exposure from a young age. It also meant that the father of the household had suddenly died or was called to battle. A son, no matter his age, could immediately pick up on his father's role and provide for the household, and thus it remained the family business. If your dad was a cobbler, he would most likely be a cobbler. Unlike the Egyptians, whose sons would branch out and try new trades as they got older and sometimes establish their family in another commerce, the medieval English really stayed stuck in their ways, to the point that when they finally did adopt last names, they were usually that of their profession, which is why you'll see a lot of brewers, smiths, archer, fisher, pot and so forth. But before 1066, you survived off of only one name, which doesn't seem that bad, but it definitely was. Let's explain why. Problem one, if, if you're in a room with like three Williams, you can't just yell a last name to find the specific William you need. Problem two, let's say one of these Williams kills someone in the room and the dying man says William killed him, but there's no way for him to tell you which one it was 
Now all the Williams in town get rounded up. Problem three, there's no cameras, and the eyewitnesses can verify three of the Williams in town as being in the room, but nobody can determine which one killed the man since they're all five four white dudes with brown hair. How do we resolve this problem? Depends on the village, the clergy, and how much those Williams were each liked in town if anybody had a bias towards them. They may determine the right one, they may decide to hang all of them because they don't know who did it. When surnames were introduced, they'd often include a nickname, such as Richard Red if your hair was red. If Richard went bald over time, he could change it to Richard Bald. And now our last reason you couldn't survive is just by being Cornish. If you were Cornish, you weren't regarded as English. When the Truro received its crown charter in 1173, it addressed it to the barons of Cornwall and all men, both Cornish and English. Let's break into why that is in a little known history lesson. Cornish is straightforward, Celtic people native to the island of Britain. English is more complicated, derived from a Scottish pronunciation of the word Angles. The Scots, and eventually all of the Celts, had adopted this word to refer to the Angles and the Saxons who'd been invading their lands and who would soon form together to declare themselves the kings, forcing control over the Cornish people. The Cornish were made to do hard labour in mines, their language made illegal, and they were taxed to death to fund the other English colonial wars and pursuits, originally with the other Celts and then in the Americas, Africa and India. Funding these colonial wars meant that the English stripped the land, so they clear cut every tree and ran every mine dry, killing millions of Cornish people in the process. The Cornish rose up against the English tyrants many times, and on several occasions would have overthrown London itself if it had not been for terrible betrayals from supposed allies. Eventually, there was not enough wealth in Cornwall to sustain the Cornish. Millennia of Roman wars and occupation followed by English wars and occupation had destroyed the land and broken the people. This is what drove the Cornish dysphoria, and it's why there's now 10 times as many English in Cornwall than there are actual Cornish people. Elders there still suffer the effects of intergenerational trauma and PTSD. Number 10, duels. The Dark Ages, yeah, a lot of fun. Hope you're prepared at all times to defend your home, your family, and your honor. Good luck, you get a really sh sword as well, break a leg or two. Medieval duels were a common spectacle among men. It was a means to settle disputes and display bravery and stand like this and talk like this, of course. Dressed to the nines in armor and tights, knights clashed on horseback and on foot, wielding swords, maces, and shields. I wouldn't be able to carry any of those. My arms would be shaking just trying to hold a shield. They're so heavy. They're so impossibly heavy. These intense one-on-one -on -one bouts were governed by strict rules, often overseen by heralds or nobles. Ah, uh, yes, our noble Joe Rogan. Logan will oversee this bout. Now bump fists. Ping. Duels showcased a knight's honor with victory, bringing respect to the land. Yeah, you gotta bring that respect back to your land or else you're not coming back to that land. The outcomes impacted social standing and reputation. While duels had its risks, it was an integral part of medieval culture. So go support your medieval times, dudes. Go eat some chicken and watch an $80 show. They're pretty fun. I haven't been yet. Number nine, falconry. This one's pretty bad. So when you think of the dark ages and the jobs that were available, we often forget about this one. This one's pretty cool. Falconry was a popular pastime among noblemen during the medieval period. It involved the training and hunting with birds of prey, such as falcons, but also hawks. But hawkonry doesn't sound as cool, so we gotta say falconry. Rolls off the tongue. Rolls off thy tongue. These noble hunters formed a deep bond with their feathered companions through meticulous training. Now falcons, prized for their speed agility, and keen eyesight, these were used to pursue and capture smaller game. Falconry served as both a prestigious sport, but also a practical method of acquiring food, because, well, Uber didn't exist back then. But you know what we had? A guy with a falcon that we can trust. A scary man with a falcon who'd walk around and, and grill you all day. Number eight. Tights. I don't know I said it so angry. I'm like, tights. In medieval times, men wearing tights was a fashion trend that reflected social status and style. I got a pair of tights for running, and I'll be honest, I've never felt more like a knight in my entire life. Pull them up. Tight as a knight. Let's do this. Tights were originally worn for practical purposes, like keeping warm and having an ease of movement, of course. But tights gradually became a symbol of high fashion among the upper classes. Of course. Can we do that with sweatpants now? Can we? I feel like we're close. They accentuated the physique and showcased a man's wealth and refined taste, you can say. Sure, we'll get onto that in a little bit. Yeah, all of that in one pair of tights. How lucky were we? Tights were often brightly colored, sometimes even covered in fun patterns. They're your tights. You're living in them. Get creative. Why not? This fashion statement eventually influenced modern day styles. So next time you see a jogger, just think that's a noble knight right there. 
running to his next bout with his water belt. Number seven, cod pieces. Since we're talking about tights, let's talk about what we stuffed inside said pants said pantaloons. In medieval history, cod pieces were a peculiar fashion accessory trend, whatever. They were worn by men. Now these padded or stuffed coverings were designed to protect, but also emphasize the groin area. And it got really stupid. They really got carried away with it. It became a joke almost immediately. Originally serving a practical purpose, cod pieces eventually became exaggerated and decorative, symbolizing masculinity. Again, all while wearing tights, which is so funny. What a sight to see. Some guy wearing like the biggest cup you've ever seen. You're like, this isn't cool. You don't look like a really cool guy right now. Why is there so bumpy? You should go see the local barber and get that checked out. Uh, their size and prominence varied over time with some, of course, reaching comical proportions. Portions, covering them in diamonds, studs. Like, you know, it doesn't look, that doesn't look good, man. Hashtag not hot, get out of here. Number six, public bathing. Bathing establishments, such as a bathing house or a communal tub, these provided a place for men to gather and cleanse themselves. It was so disgusting. Now you think guys are gross now in the washroom and whatever goes on in there. Back then, these gatherings were considered a social gathering where men would interact, relax, and discuss various matters. Official means, okay? Watching a guy washes behind while he's pitching you a beard tax. You're like, okay, sure, perfect place for a meeting. Let's do it. Mind if I cover up first? Weirdo. The act of bathing back then was seen as both a physical and a spiritual purification. Ah, uh, yes, so spiritual. All this is really transcending me. I love it. Let's go home and plan some stuff. While nudity was not unusual back in these settings, modesty was still valued just a smidgen. So individuals would often use towels or cloths for some level of privacy during these meetings. Thank God. How vulnerable is that? Like, hey, any ideas? You're like, yeah, man, I'm naked. Why don't we get dressed first? Here's my idea. Number five, arming squire. Being a knight, obviously it sounds cool. They have the sword, the horse, the flowing hair, whatever. They're saving the damsel in distress. Sometimes they lose a hand like Jamie Lannister. Spoilers, you had 10 years. But that's just what being a knight is, right? It wasn't always a fairy tale epic being a knight. I mean, first of all, this process starts when you're young. When you were seven years old, you would be given to a noble to learn for seven more years. And then at age 14, quick maths. At age 14, you would become a squire. A squire is a knight's intern, not an ideal job to have when you're a wee lad, but it's a job in the medieval times nonetheless. Can't complain. Also, you had no choice. Get going. Arming squires, they had a lot of responsibility. Arming squires would repair a knight's armor while they were still wearing it, you know? Which buckle was it? Oh, okay, that one. Ugh, it's pretty wet and damp. Yeah, fixing up chain mail on a grown man's thigh. That ought to suck, welcome to the dark ages. Also after these epic messy battles, arming squires would have to clean everything off their armor. Everything, yeah. A lot of yuck, and this was long before Dawn soap was ever a thing. So they had to clean with urine. Yeah, it gets worse and worse, doesn't it? Welcome to medieval times, moving on. Number four. Jesters. The earliest account of the fool, they go back to the 11th century. Now these fools were hired to liven up the party. Most of you may have an image of a jester in your head, jumping on tables, telling jokes, farting on your aunt and uncle. It's pretty accurate. That was his job. Pretty cool. It was one of the best jobs to have, all things considered back then, this title of a minstrel or a fool. It was an honor to have. The fool's payment was also no joke. Roland Le Pature, he was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II. As long as he showed up to court every year on Christmas Day to fart around. Literally, he would whistle, jump around, and actually fart. And in doing so, he had acres of land. That was loaded, because he was just farting on people. Imagine eating beans on Christmas Day, having a nice time with your family, and then Roland jumps on the table, starts farting on your grandma, then he leaps back over to his mansion. I hate this, I hate the dark ages. Let's move on, I'm getting angry. Tell no one. Number three, groom of the stool. Nowadays, higher ups in the office, they have assistants grab your coffee for you, maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off golfing, you know, whatever you wanna do. Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool, that was a bit much when it comes to assistants. Did their assistance. We have some labor laws put in place now that I don't think we're gonna see an online job opening for a groom of the stool anytime soon. But hey, who knows? Fingers crossed. I'd love to see this again. That's pretty funny. Back in the dark ages, this role was vital and respected. It was created by King Henry VIII. Now this role was to assist the king, specifically to assist his bowel movements, his activities, his big old king <sighs> sessions. You had a box that you had to carry at all times. Now that was where um, all the magic happened in said box, the dark magic that is. And you would literally follow the king around until he needed to use this box. Cause porta potties weren't a thing back then and there's no way you're gonna catch a king squatting in the woods so now we're here. Now this is your job. In fact, you wouldn't even find that king wiping his own behind. That chore was also reserved 
for the groom of the stool. You're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this rule? A prisoner? Somebody who lost their sense of smell, hopefully, ideally? No, only sons of noblemen could take on this rule. And in doing so, they also gained access to every room tons of clothes, and any bedchamber furnishings in a castle. And of course, high pay, thank God. Okay, maybe I would do it, that's not bad. Would you wipe an ass for a castle, Chris? Probably, right, not bad. You wipe your own for, you know, for no, for no castle, so that's fine. We can get you a castle. Number two, dentist, barber, surgeon combo. Get three appointments in one, all in 10 minutes or less. How lucky are you to be alive in the dark ages? Back then, dentists were not a thing. You weren't gently encouraged to floss more. You didn't have a fun chair that went back real slow, but they did have solutions. They had one solution, and that was to pull everything. Cavity, gone. Toothache, see you later. Maybe you accidentally bit a rock, you chipped a molar, eh, doesn't matter. We're gonna pull it all regardless. They would only pull your teeth out. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, and bloodletting. I'm like, perfect, I need all of those today. What are the odds? They would use tools like forceps, pliers, and scraping instruments, all to address dental issues. However, and believe it or not, their practices lacked advanced techniques and understanding of modern dentistry. You don't say. Three jobs in one, yeah, I wonder how long that took to graduate. That's a Hefty program right there. So like, oh, it's 18 years. You're gonna love it. Yeah, no pay. It's good. And finally, number one, the beard tax. Here we go. You may have heard about the cheese tax, but have you heard about the beard tax? This is good. I would have been fine. I really tried earlier this year. Couldn't do it, but I'm bald guy forever. That's cool. I would have saved money in the dark ages. My God, I would have had like savings. Would have been a good, great time. The beard tax emerged in certain regions as a means of gathering revenue and enforcing social norms. Men were required to pay a tax based on the length of their beards and in some cases, even the width or the shape. They're like, we don't like that, give us $5 right now. Lice infestations were a common problem due to the limited access of personal hygiene and sanitary practices, you know, men bathing together, pitching ideas, didn't help. However, the length and density of beards provided a natural barrier against lice. So it was believed that back then, the oils present in the beard's hair made it difficult for lice to crawl around and survive. Therefore, men often grew their beards as long as they could to prevent lice infestation. That's why Vikings had such big, long, gray beards. I take that back. I actually would have been screwed back then. I would have been so itchy. I'm itchy now, just thinking about it. I'm getting out of here. See you. Those are the top 10 unusual things that men went through in the medieval ages. And you know what? Next time, I'm going to do women. It's going to be horrible. Witches and just more witch stuff. It's really, it was, it was the worst time. Start off with something that may be somewhat of a familiar career. So we're gonna start with chariot riders. It goes without saying that people don't really remember that there's places outside of Europe when it comes to the medieval ages, and they never come up in conversation. The Bayezidine Empire had existed since 395, and it ended when the medieval era did in 1453. And one high-paced, action-packed, yet wildly dangerous job that was flexing the great wealth and progress of the empire Empire was chariot racing, which differed from modern horse racing or even NASCAR racing. You were exposed, the chariots had no backs, and you were standing without any seat belts or restraints to keep you from flying off. You could be smashed against the stone pillars, dragged to your death behind your own horses. The appeal of racing for the fans appeared to be the same as the modern fans. Testosterone, adrenaline, bloodshed, and gambling. Racers, meanwhile, had the potential for a fortune and their freedom, because that's what made the job suck. It's chariot riders weren't free men. And knowing you could win 15 bags of gold, uh, yeah, you're gonna kill any other racer who tries to get in your way. Because if you lose, you're just going back to hard labor. There were four teams in the Biazatine chariot racing. The whites, the greens, the blues, and the reds. Eventually these teams merged and it just became the greens and the blues. And the fans were so passionate about the sport that, that when they weren't throwing nail studded tablets under the track to sabotage opponents, they were breaking into bloody brawls to support their own team. And now on the complete flip side, in primitive medieval Europe, a job called Flatulist. As someone who reads and writes about history all day, every day, I really do have a hard time with how the Europeans got so high and mighty and dubbed everyone else primitive when they literally lived like it was the New Jersey's public landfill and had the humor to match. So yeah, believe it or not, royals would actually employ an individual called a flatulist to entertain crowds sigh by farting. These individuals would pass gas in what they called amusing manners, such as to music or even on certain cues to 
to get big laughs. Irish gas performers were called bridge tours instead of flatulists. Saint Augustine, of all people, once wrote about flatulists, saying that they possess such a command of their bowels and can break wind continuously at will, so as to produce the effect of singing. As if it couldn't get more weirdly infuriating, some flatulists were actually considered celebrities of their time. One was Roland the Farter, who performed for Henry II's court annually. After several years, Henry rewarded him with 30 acres of land, a giant manor, for his skilled entertainment. Let's hear about how these old ladies would just you're healed. In ancient and medieval Europe, a group of wise women who were mostly elderly would give insight into medical issues primarily concerning the female body that the male counterparts had yet to grasp. And some of these homeopathic healers would actually spit on young ladies three times in order to protect them from the evil eye. Talk about a weird job, huh? This custom of spitting opens up a wide subject. Not only is it practiced in the hope of obtaining good fortune for the spit e, but amongst all ages and almost all people had been considered as an act to safeguard the spitter as well. According to Theocritius, amongst the ancient Greeks and Romans, the most common remedy against an invidious look was spitting. It was hence called despir malam. It is necessary to spit three times into the breast of the person who fears fascination. Invidious look and fascination is in reference to the evil eye. Old women were accustomed to avert the evil eye from children by spitting onto their own bosoms. And among the ancient Greeks, where this tradition even came from, it was custom to do the triple spit into your own bosom at the sight of someone with a condition or ailment you wish not to be stricken with. Leprosy, maybe they're a madman, maybe they're struggling with epilepsy. This act was done in defiance of the omen and spitting is known to be a sign of aversion, bidding it not come into their life as it had to the individual stricken with it. These spitting grannies were some of the first women hunted because they were believed to be evil sorceresses and witches. Because if farting was an entertainment, animal eviscerations were? Meet the bear leaders, an unusual historical profession involving exactly what the name describes, literally leading bears from village to village. Bears were mostly used for blood sports like bear baiting in which packs of dogs were set to fight against the bear. You can imagine how that'd go. Both Henry IV and Elizabeth I were famously fans of that horrific bloodshed and, by the Tudor era, increasing numbers of bear pits or bear gardens were constructed in major cities. Bear leaders allowed villagers to enjoy entertainment of the big city bear baiting fights in the comfort of their own homes. Incidentally, by the 18th century, the term bear leader actually came to refer to a different profession altogether. They were literally tutor and babysitter hybrids who were hired by parents to keep boisterous young noble sons under control and out of trouble, particularly during the Grand Tour. What's that mean? Taking care of crappy noble child was the same as handling bears. So let me think, leading bears from city to city making money in the medieval era, or raising a spoiled entitled child in an era where there's no water, washing the snot off their face or the stickiness off their fingers. Bear, bear, I'll take the bear. Can I get some bears over here? Bear, yeah. Here's one that's still a job to this day, adult adoptee. Japan's birth rate is probably worse than that of a nunnery, but they do have the second largest adoption rate, 90% of which is in between two adult Japanese men. This is often because the older man's employee or their pre-existing son-in-law, who could then agree per contract to take the name of his now sister wife, but they can be flexible negotiators in a sun search. For example, if the younger man still has a starter pack parents, the older man will happily offer those parents a buyout. If their new handpicked son is already married, they'll also just adopt his wife as part of the package deal. Like most hardcore Japanese business practices, this weird form of feudal meritocracy can be traced back to the age of medieval samurai. For centuries, Japanese nobles would seek out competent young men to audition for who wants to be the next clan heir. And nowadays, major companies like Mitsubishi, Toyota, and Canon have actually been handed over to former CEOs adopted children. The practice of using adoption to pick the next pada familias was also popular with the ancient Roman nobility. An example being the first proper emperor, Augustus aka Octavian. He was only a distant relative of Julius Caesar until he was adopted in the dead dictator's will to continue the hostile takeover of Rome. But the European practice of adult adoption existed and then was wiped out by the new feudal nobility during the medieval ages. Not because they wanted to create a more competitive market for baby orphans. After all, how would the church get its free labor if not by people dropping them off on their steps? On the contrary, these Christian rulers banned adoption altogether, believing nobody deserves to be part of a good family unless they slid into that privilege on a wave of nepotism and discarded placenta. 
And speaking of Christianity, how about a church position called the Sluggard Wakers? Which is quite the name. Guess the only thing worse for the church's holy sanctuary than dangerous stray dogs was the presence of conked out parishioners. Sluggard Wakers were volunteers that patrolled the pews and ensured that none of the congregation was falling asleep when they should be praising their Lord. They were literally Jesus snitches. If you were caught dozing off during the service, the Sluggard Waker had the sacred duty to wallop you on the head, and not lightly. The sleeper usually clobbered with something like a club, a rod, or a switch bundle. Some of the more aggressive sluggard wakers used forks or brass tipped staffs or metal knobs to do the job. The sting of rebuke was supposed to wake you and remind you to remain awake and vigilant for your lord. Jesus wasn't sleeping on you, now is he? No. Some sluggard wakers were volunteer members of the congregation. Some wakers were members of the church staff, such as the parish clerk. Other wakers were also knock knobblers because when there were no dogs to drive off, there were likely congregants to wake up. I should probably explain all the dogs in church talk I'd be doing, so knock knobblers are next. Medieval Europeans lived in filth. Their structures all sucked and so did their economy. Does it really surprise you that the church would just have its doors wide open? Does it really surprise you if they didn't have windows? Of course animals can get in, so knock knobblers had the unique task of chasing wild dogs out of the church to protect the congregation, especially the priest who's most at risk while holding the full loaves of bread for service. Elderly men holding warm loaves of bread were probably some very easy prey for a hungry, unscrupulous d wild dog. And as someone who survived being mauled by a dog, the terrifying reality is once they're on you, it can be incredibly difficult to get them off. So this job would actually be super necessary. Always remember, protect the face and neck. So a novel knocker was given a whip and a pair of dog tongs. The whip was used just to scare the dogs away. The tong was used to clasp the animal from a safe distance so they could be removed from property. Their methods and ideology were the precursors to modern animal control departments and their tools. Knock nobblers didn't stop there though. If wild dogs weren't running around, they would instead turn their attention to unruly and disobedient children. If scolding didn't work, the knock nobbler would remove the child from service too. The amount of avoidable child screaming I've heard at a synagogue? Yo, I feel like we should just bring this back. I love this job. Before the phone book, the pocket book, a blackberry, or even gasp apple was the nomenclator. We all know the person or are the person who cannot remember names or dates to save their literal life. If that is the case, you'd be better suited hiring one of these guys rather than working as one. Nomenclotters were serfs tasked with remembering other people's names, status, and important impressive details for their lords at public events. This way you aren't carrying a quill and parchment around for reference, and imagine how much more impressive it is to, for the fair damsels that you remember her address and her father's companies just like that. Or well, at least the dude standing next to you does for you, but whatever. Sometimes the nomenclator's job would be hiked up a notch and they would have to remember more information for their master because homeboy got drunk or zooted. it. This could be details from prior conversations, plans to meet someone somewhere, things they've lied about and now you have to upkeep for them. Even just basic information about the individuals your master has been speaking to throughout the evening. Essentially, Norman Clatters were phone books before it was cool and embarrassment prevention babysitters. No better thing to title it, so let's just call it by its name, Piss Prophet. The Piss Prophet, also called a water scryger because ho oh, ho, that's so much better, was a doctor who diagnosed disease from the sight, smell, and taste of a patient's urine. This term seems to originate from the 1600s, but the profession itself dates back to the medieval era. Now I gotta play devil's advocate a little bit because scientifically this isn't quite as insane as it sounds. Some conditions can really be diagnosed with urine alone, such as diabetes, which makes urine sweet. And as we would all know, dehydration causes strong dark colored urine, and UTIs can leave blood in urine. If you and I can recognize at least two of those things from sight without our doctor present, it's not totally gross that they give it a little dip and a lick. <laughs> and now we're cutting the crossroads. Hey, so want to hear a fun sentence? Samurai sometimes tested swords by attacking random passerbys. Yeah, so in medieval Japan, it was considered dishonorable if a samurai sword couldn't cut through an opponent's body in one stroke. It was important then for a samurai to know about the quality of his weapon, so every new sword he got had to be tested before he took into battle. Naturally, it's got to be a realistic test too. So samurai mostly practiced this through and through cut style on corpses or on criminals. That's normal, kind of what you would expect, but corpses need to be whole in their culture, so not many people wanted to just offer theirs up for the chop chop. And well, Japan had 
has some efficient execution methods that were a lot more painful and slow for the criminals and taught the public a lot more. So you would never guess what the method was lined up to fill that void instead, and somehow legally approved, condoned, and excused as a ceremonial way to go. Sujigiri translated means crossroad killing because the targets were random everyday commoners who were minding their own business and happened to need to walk through an intersection at night the way that we all do at some point. And samurai would quite literally chop these people down. Bodies would be found by others or in the early morning and there was never anyone to blame and you technically couldn't be angry or seek revenge. This was government approved and sanctioned activity. Incidents of sujigiri were rare in the early medieval period but began to pick up in the 1200s when more sociopathic or psychopathic samurai started to, pun intended, overkill it. By the warring states period, the end of the medieval area, sujigiri became a dishonorable act. Samurai and kabukimono robes turned into a horrific popular pastime. In fact, one Edo era report from the year 1600 details the early years of the period, claiming that people were killed in sujigiri every night on certain crossroads in what's now modern day Tokyo. This continued to escalate so the authorities felt they had to ban it in 1602, only a few decades after the medieval period finally ended. Number 10. Trial by Jury The concept of trial by jury can be traced back to ancient Greece and Rome. Don't get me wrong, that's old school. But the first recorded use of a modern jury system, that dates back to the 12th century England. Medieval England, yes, let's get some men in a room and point at witches. Henry II introduced the practice to replace previous methods of trial, which at that point was relying on physical combat or divine intervention, all that kind of like that. Under this new system, a group of 12 men from the community would be chosen to hear evidence and determine the guilt or innocence of said accused. Right? A little better. A little, you know, less witchcraft, more, okay, we're all talking now. We're conversing. This system gradually spread throughout Europe and then beyond, so on, and Danforth, and it became an important cornerstone of many modern legal systems. Back in the day, this was a noble deed. It was an honor to be part of the jury, you know? Today, not, not really so much. Not the same at all. You're like, what? No, I don't want to do that. It's going to take so long. It's going to be like four weeks of jury duty. I haven't done it yet. I've just jinxed myself. I'm going to get called any day now. Don't answer, you know what I mean? Just don't answer your mail. Don't look, just avoid it. That's what I do. Number nine, the stocks. All right, relax, stock bros. I'm not talking about those stocks. I'm talking medieval stocks. Those ones are... A bit different. Those ones were very bad. Those are all bad. The stocks were a common form of punishment in medieval times. The convicted person's ankles were locked into these wooden boards with holes for their feet and stuff. And their hands were sometimes also restrained. We've seen this before. Usually people are like this. You go to a theme park, you pose with your family in one of these things. You're like, hey, I'm stuck. You're like, get me out, this is scary. They would be left in public spaces like that, such as the marketplace or town square, anywhere public because, why of course, you know, shame, shame, we gotta shame everyone back then. And if that wasn't bad enough, the accused would then be pelted with food or even physically attacked by the crowd. Imagine that, imagine being so sparse for food and you're like, yeah, let's throw our bread at that guy. It's like, what, what a waste, we need that. The duration of the punishment is varied, but it could range from a few hours to several days. Yeah, locked up like this for days at a time. What a joke. It was used for various crimes, theft, drunkenness, and slander. And it was intended to humiliate and shame the offender while also serving as a deterrent to others. Guys like, oh, I'd hate to be that guy over there. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's throw food at him now. Sick, so dumb, so dumb. Number eight, the drunkard's cloak. Yeah, this one's uh, quite funny. Not really, but we'll see. The drunkard's cloak, also known as the barrel or the shaming cloak, again, shame, shame, big important step back there. This is a humiliating punishment used in medieval times for people who were drunk or disorderly in public. This person, this drunk person, they were forced to wear a large barrel or a cloak made of wood or heavy cloth, something big and obvious with holes cut out for their heads and arms. Like they're a big mascot, a big barrel mascot in medieval times. And sometimes they would have offensive messages or images painted on it. You know what I mean? Like the piece of paper that says, kick me. That was like the old school version of that, much worse. The person would then be paraded through town in this garment, this outfit, this big barrel and not fun, often with crowds throwing garbage or food at them. You know, that kind of medieval Game of Thrones stuff. This punishment was intended to publicly shame the person as well. So yeah, shame and then we'll go into the rough nitty gritty stuff at the end here. Number seven, eavesdropping. Eavesdropping back in the day. I mean, today we've all done it, right? We've all listened at some point in our lives to somebody we don't know. Every time I hear somebody in our hallway, in our apartment, I have to look, right? I'm like, who is it? 
someone breaking in. But if you did it during the dark ages, if you listened in on a conversation you weren't supposed to hear, well, there were some serious consequences that were waiting for you. Eavesdropping was considered a serious crime back then. That's why they're always whispering in Game of Thrones. Now it makes sense, right? The act of secretly listening in on someone's conversation without their knowledge and or consent while this crime was viewed as a breach of privacy and trust. <sighs> How dare thee? It was often associated with other crimes such as treason or espionage. This was a big bat. Espionage? Are you kidding? Just because you heard someone say something? Get out of here. Punishments here could include fines, public humiliation, classic, imprisonment, or... Yeah, remember what happened to Littlefinger in Game of Thrones? Not great. There's worse stuff that could be done. Yikes. Horrible. Number six, Pacific hunting. Yeah, you gotta be sure which, uh, where you throw an arrow back then. In medieval England, the hunting of the king's deer was considered a very serious crime. Yeah, not that deer. That one's fine, but just don't you hit that one. Mm -mm. The act of killing or even injuring a deer was punished harshly under the royal forest law, which was enforced by the king's foresters. That'd be a cool job, just rolling through the forest looking for people. The law applied only to the king's forests, which were areas of land set aside specifically for hunting for his food. Violators could be subjected to a variety of punishments, including fines, imprisonments, and even mutilation. Yeah, a little different than public humiliation. It's just mutilation this time. This law was meant to preserve the deer population for the king's personal use and enjoyment, and served as a way for the monarchy to maintain control over the forest and the resources that it provided. So if you want food, go to that the forest over there. It's not even a forest, it's like a marsh. It's horrible. It's like three frogs left. Good luck. Number five, Heretic's Fork. Yeah, a lot like this. This one sucked. The medieval Heretic's Fork was a device used during the Inquisition to punish individuals accused of heresy. You hear the wrong stuff and then you say the wrong stuff, no matter what you do, bad punishment awaits. Some fork's going in a place you don't want it to be. This punishment consisted of a long metal fork with two prongs that were placed under the chin and the sternum of the accused, making it so you had to stay upright or else, yeah, not good. The device was designed to keep the person awake and prevent them from speaking and or swallowing, and if they do so, it would cause extreme pain. The prongs here could be adjusted to vary the amount of pressure applied, and the device was often left in place for hours or, again, like the other punishment, even days at a time, which is horrible. The heretic's fork was cruel and it was a form of psychological punishment that was used to extract confessions and punish those who dared to speak out against the church. Yes, how dare thee? Now hold still. Number four, sewer surfing. Uh, it's not as cool as you're imagining, but it's something along those lines. Also known as sewer hunting and or draining, sewer surfing was a popular but illegal activity during the dark ages and involved navigating through the underground sewage systems of cities, typically for thievery or other illicit activities, trying to find some gold, something, I don't know, something shady going on under the city. Sewer surfing was often punished severely, more than you'd think here. Guys going through garbage, they're like, ah, hang him. It's like, what? what? It was also considered a violation of the law and a danger to public health. You go down there, you come back up with, I don't know, a plague that you found down there? You don't want that. You don't want a rat to bite you. Offenders would face fines, imprisonment, or even the gallows. However, despite the risks and penalties, many people, many people, continued to participate in this dangerous activity as it was their only means of survival or adventure, or money or goods or anything really. It led to numerous arrests and punishments throughout the medieval period. Honestly, Fair, I don't know, you never know. Somebody may have lost a nice pocket watch or maybe you'll find rats and then get really sick. 50-50. I found a pocket watch. Also, the town is violently ill, so I'm rich, sorry. Number three, blasphemy. Blasphemy, you almost have to yell it every time you say it, you know? Blasphemy was considered a serious crime in medieval times. It involved speaking ill or speaking contemptuously about God, Jesus, and or the church. That's a big no-no back then, big no-no. This was seen as a direct attack <laughs> a direct attack to God and the faith. It was considered a threat to the very fabric of society just because you said some shit. Blasphemers could be punished in various ways. At this point, you probably know them. Imprisonment, flogging, and or, well, yeah, just you're dead now. In some cases, offenders were forced to wear a blasphemer's bridle, which was a metal mask with a spike that was inserted into the offender's mouth, which would, of course, prevent them from speaking more. Blasphemy laws varied across different regions and periods throughout medieval European history, but they all shared a common goal of protecting the sanity of religious beliefs and shoving metal into a human's mouth. All those things were very important to the faith. It's good stuff. Number two, beard tax. I tried to grow a beard for like two weeks, and I just, I just immediately bailed on the whole thing. I was like, 
Hey, you'll see me guys, I'll show you. And then I came back, didn't even talk about it. In medieval times, I would have been fine, honestly. This is a, it's a weird tax. There were periods and regions in medieval history where facial hair was regulated and or frowned upon. Imagine that, right? Guys trying to grow it out, it's a little, has a little stubble. Everyone's like, ugh. Really, Alexander the Seventh? Really? During the reign of Henry the Eighth in England, a beard tax, a beard tax, cha-ching, was imposed to, well, only men with beards over two weeks old. They were required to pay. If you were day 13, they're like, all right, we'll see you tomorrow. You better figure it out, figure this whole thing out, mister. Vikings, however, what about them? In the Dark Ages, Vikings, they were all about the beards. What happened? Beards, when it came to Vikings, they were highly valued and considered a sign of masculinity and strength. Again, I'd be screwed if it was that time. I'd be good over here, but then I'm a very weak man over here. Know what I mean? No tax and then no muscle. Taylor McWaters, no tax and no muscle. Huh. And finally, number one, not reporting a dead body. Yeah, we've all seen Stand By Me. This can lead to some problems, some troublesome things. This last one here is pretty obvious in theory, but the way that they handled it back then was pretty crazy. We're not doing it the same today. Thank God. Thank the church and the lords. In medieval times, roughly around 1240, the law surrounding the discovery of a dead body, ha, huh, surprise, what's this? Who is this? This varied depending on the region and the time period. But generally, if somebody discovered a Huh, who is this uh, skeleton? What's this? Generally, at that time, they required to report it to the courts or the lords. The lords, you know the lords, go tell the lords. Failure to do so could result in punishment, as of course, it was considered suspicious behavior. Fair, okay, fair. More often than not, the person who found the body, they would be asked to provide information about the circumstances surrounding the death, including any and all possible suspects. Yeah, so, uh, Take a guess. He had wood teeth, he looked old and medieval. I don't know, he was someone. In some cases, the finder may have been entitled to a reward for discovering the body, but in other cases, you yourself could be charged with the death. So, 50-50, might get some money, might go to jail. If that was me, I'd be like, nope, I didn't see a thing, sir. I was just looking up at space, wondering what that big rock in the sky is. I don't know what gravity is. All women are witches, right, brother? Cheers, <laughs> didn't see anything. Starting our list off at number 10, natural disasters. We'll begin with the Great Flood of 1607, because, eh, why not? This flood was a catastrophic event that affected the southwestern coast of England. Now, the flood occurred during the night of January 30th, 1607. Happy New Year, I guess. Let's all run for our lives. And it was caused by a combination of heavy rain and high tides. This, in turn, caused floodwaters to rise up several meters and destroying villages, crops, livestock, and, sadly, claimed the lives of roughly 2,000 people. Sounds pretty tragic, but believe me, this is number 10. Yeah, it only gets worse right after this. Turn the clock back a few hundred years to the Great Storm of 1362. As its name suggests, this too was a massive storm that hit Northern Europe, of course causing widespread flooding and destruction. It was one of the most destructive natural disasters in recorded history, with an estimated 25,000 people losing their lives. Sounds bad for number 10, but honestly, the lives lost it just gets bigger and bigger as the list goes, believe it or not. Number nine, medical care or lack thereof. In medieval England, medical care was limited and often um, ineffective. Yeah, nothing really worked that well because they didn't know what was happening, right? Instead of cavities, they thought you had worms crawling around in your teeth. Good old toothworms. Knock that out with a rusty hammer. Knowledge was limited, physicians were expensive and mostly treated wealthy patients at the time, while the peasants over here, us peasants eating bread, rotten dry bread breaking our teeth, well, we got the barber surgeons who performed basic surgeries and bloodletting. That's about it. It's all they did. You walked in, you're walking out lightheaded. You're gonna faint immediately. They were a barber slash dentist slash surgeon. What? You already know you're screwed when you see that resume. Herbal remedies and charms were commonly used because, well, it's all they had. And the church played a significant role in healing practices. Aside from that, not much left. You're, yeah, you're SOL, my friend. Hospitals were established to care for the sick, but conditions were often unsanitary and going there led to the spread of disease rather than curing anything. Medical knowledge, again, was so limited and many diseases and injuries were untreatable, leading to a high mortality rate that we're gonna talk about a bit later. Ooh, it gets worse, it gets worse. Number eight, punishments. The pillory was a device that consisted of a wooden framework with holes for the head and the hands. Offenders were placed in the pillory while they were publicly exposed and sometimes pelted with rotten food and or hard objects. Sounds pretty nasty. The whipping post is exactly what you would imagine. A wooden post to which offenders were bound to and then of course they were whipped with a whip or a rod. This punishment was often used for minor offenses, believe it or not. Uh, yeah, it gets worse. The ducking stool was a chair attached to a long pole that was used to dunk offenders in water, often in a pond or a river, dirty river, you get an ear infection in that one for sure. 
It was used to punish scolds and nagging wives. Yeah, bring on your nagging wives. We'll just take them for a dip, I guess. Your arms are gonna be jacked by the end of it. The brank, this was a metal mask that was placed over the head of the offender with a sharp piece of metal, and then that metal would go in your mouth and prevent you from talking. It's like a saw trap. As I was describing it, I was freaking myself out just then. This punishment was often used for gossipers. Yeah, again, these were all minor offenses, all things considered. Today, you get a slap on the wrist. Back then, you get rotten food hucked at you. What? Number seven, poor sanitation. Yeah, you're gonna wash your hands many a times in medieval England. Oh boy, sing happy birthday thrice. How does that sound? Sanitation during medieval England was very poor and resulted in widespread diseases and epidemics. Thought today was yucky, eh, way worse. There was a lack of understanding of hygiene and the connection between poor sanitation and illness. Waste and sewage were commonly disposed of in the streets, just hey, why not, what up? Or it was dumped in the Thames, leading to a high concentration of filth and contaminants Contamination, which I'll talk, I'll talk about that more later. That's a really bad day happens with that river. Public bathhouses were both used for bathing and toilets. So pick which side you're gonna use accordingly. Better, better be confident which side you're going into. This of course led to the increase of diseases being spread. The lack of proper waste management also attracted rats and other vermin, which again carried fleas and other diseases. So it was just a big bad circle. The Great Stink of London. This one here was a major environmental crisis. It was a crisis, a stinky crisis that occurred in the summer the hot summer of 1858. The River Thames, which flowed through the heart of the city, well, this was heavily polluted with raw sewage and industrial waste, and the stench was so bad, Parliament had to suspend its sessions. Number six, lot of rats. Yep, watch your feet, it's medieval England, they're gonna bite ya. Imagine you're with your friends and family, you know, gathering around a table, eating bread, drinking ale, gathered around one candle, telling tales, good old medieval times, then all of a sudden you feel a tickle on your leg, what could that be? Be a shame if, I don't know, hundreds of rats began to swarm your feet out of nowhere. Yeah, welcome to the dark ages. This happened. Rats would come out of nowhere and it would suck. Then you have the plague. The plague rolled, or crawled rather, into medieval times back in 1328. And it lasted until 1350. That is a very long time to be stuck with plague rats. It was actually horrible. Don't get me wrong, our plague sucked. That was a lousy few years, no doubt about it. You know, a lot of Ozark, a lot of Netflix, a lot of time off. But I sure as hell didn't see any random swarms of black rats. Did you? Maybe, I don't know, where were you? The European population was reduced by a third and rats were the main cause of spreading. Yeah, way to go guys, you nailed it. Ratatouille and Stuart Little, all you guys planning your little rat attacks, nasty, you're all nasty. No franchises for either of you, no more. These hairy balls of yuck pass it on to everybody. We gotta move on before I throw up. Number five, superstition. Ah uh, yes, here we go, this one's good. In the medieval era, cats were often associated with witchcraft. Cause of course, look at them, right? So evil. The church, which held great power during the medieval period, condemned cats as a symbol of paganism and the devil, of course leading to widespread persecution. However, the rapid decline of cats led to a significant increase in that rodent population. Yeah, remember those fun balls of fur that I just mentioned? That's where this all started because of evil devil cats. It was our fault the whole time. Who would have thought? The condemning of cats led to a surge in a number of rats and mice that carried diseases. King Edgar the Peaceful, so peaceful, we know him. He reigned from 959 to 975. He issued a law in the 10th century that set a value on cats and imposed fines on anyone who harmed or killed them. Now we're talking, now we're getting back into the nice peaceful, the peaceful, I mean, come on. The law was intended to encourage the breeding and keeping of cats as they were now seen as valuable for controlling the rodent population that threatened crops, food supplies, and um, us. We matter as well, I guess, humans. Number four, law and order. Misuse of weights and measures. Yes, false advertising back in the old Golden days. Let's talk about this. How did you sell stuff without, you know, getting caught? Medieval merchants were required to use standard weights and measures when selling goods, right? That's protocol. And those who tried to cheat by using inaccurate measures or weights could face some brutal penalties. I just saw a video of some expert fisher and he's putting weights in a fish's mouth. He's trying to cheat his way through a fishing tournament. He got caught. It was on Reddit. It was so funny. But like back in the medieval times, he would have been screwed. Fraudulent begging as well. We've seen this on Reddit at some point. Begging was a common practice in medieval times, but those who were caught faking a disability or pretending to be in dire times, well, then they could be punished with public humiliation or even physical mutilation. They rhyme, but they're very different things, those two. Eavesdropping as well, one of my favorite things to do of all time. Love listening in on things, right? Listening in on somebody else's conversation is great, but back in the dark ages, this was considered a serious crime. And those who were caught listening, hmm, what's that? They could be fined or imprisoned, and in some cases, eavesdropping was seen as a form of treason, since it could be used to gather information that could be used against the state. So sometimes, yeah, real bad. You don't want to hear the wrong thing, or else they would, you know, gallows. You hear? 
mm -mm, gallows. Number three, health plan? Yeah, question mark, cause yeah, here we go. During medieval England, the average life expectancy was around 30 to 35 years, with many people biting the bullet to poor nutrition, lack of sanitation, infectious diseases, and rats everywhere. Ugh. Living conditions sucked, limited medical knowledge was all you had, and frequent wars and famines were always rolling around. So yeah, all that in 30 years or less, how fun. Common illnesses included respiratory infection, dysentery, and tuberculosis. Medical treatments weren't great at the time, of course. There was a, a lot of prayers, that's for sure. That's a lot of people relied on those. Dark age medical treatments included herbal remedies, bloodletting, and surgical procedures performed all without anesthesia. So you're gonna feel every Wrong move to say that. However, there was also some advancements in medicine during this time, it wasn't all bad, including the founding of hospitals and the use of quarantine to prevent further spread of disease. How fun is that? Imagine being the first person to think of a quarantine. You're like, hey you, no, go over there. How does that sound? Yeah, we're doing something right now, trust me. Number two, war. What is it good for, you know? In the Middle Ages, this was a time of frequent warfare in Europe. This was due to various factors, such as the rise of feudalism, religious conflicts, and territorial disputes, all those good things. One of the most significant was the Hundred Years' War, which began in 1337 and lasted, well, as you could guess, until 1453. Yeah, it wasn't quite, it was a hundred and a bit, but you know, sounds cool if we say it like that. It was fought between England and France over control of territory in France. The war saw significant battles, such as the Battle of Agincourt and the Siege of Orleans, and it had a profound impact on both countries. Another notable medieval war, you probably heard of this one, the Crusades. Yeah, that one for sure. The Crusades were a series of religious wars fought between the Christian nations of Europe and Muslim nations of the Middle East. Now the Crusades began in 1096 and lasted until the late 13th century with varying degrees of success and failure from both sides to say the least. A lot of deaths, a lot of, a lot of warfare, a lot of horribleness, horrible ways to go. And finally, number one, plagues. The well known of these plagues back then was the Black Black Death, which, I mean, scary name, but yeah, it's pretty much nailed it. The Black Death first appeared in the mid 14th century and killed an estimated 25 million people in Europe, or at that point, one third of the population. Yersinia pestis bacterium was spread by fleas that infested rats. Again, so awful. Other medieval plagues include the Justinian Plague, which struck the Byzantine Empire in the 6th century and killed an estimated 25 million people, and the Plague of Athens, which hit, well, Athens during the Peloponnesian War in the 5th century BC. Another deadly outbreak during the medieval period was the Great Plague of Marseille in 1720, killed 100,000 people in France. While it's one thing to live life through a plague like we have done, we can be glad that it's not like these ones because they lasted much longer. And like I mentioned earlier, um, I don't f with rats. So yeah, this one seems a little more calm near the toes. That's always great, love that. First up, since we've heard a decent bit about nights before, let's start with training day or days, uh, well, years. The joke still landed, whatever. Training for knights began around age seven and it would take an average of 14 years before they were ready to battle. Essentially like going to middle and high school today. And like the school system, you moved up through the levels. Potential knights started as pages who essentially acted as an assistant or servant to their assigned Lord. Most of the training for pages began practicing with dull weapons, learning to master riding a horse, take part in hunts, and otherwise do menial tasks. At 14, pages would become squires, assuming they were still in good physical health and not a raging socio or psychopath. According to medieval Britain, once a page became a squire, he had to master the seven points of agility, which was just a really long list of sporting events. So things like shooting, fencing, wrestling, riding horses, swimming and diving, climbing, long jumping, tournaments, sports like jousting, and dancing. Okay, so that's more than seven points of agilities and dancing was in there, so let's just agree that medieval logic was a bit strange and their math skills were bad, and we can move on. After approximately five to seven years of this higher training, if they survived and had mastered all the required skills, they'd usually be officially knighted, and that's usually at age 19 to 22. You weren't taught to have your own opinions, but people are people, and that's why sometimes a knight had to battle their conscience. As a knight, you were serving God. But what did that mean? A knight could go his whole life without having the clouds overhead opening up and God sticking his head through to yell specific directions at him out of everyone on earth to choose from. So he had to turn elsewhere for guidance. Okay, so what do we got here? Well, there's, there's the priest, or you could ask the king who by virtue was a direct mouthpiece of God, which by the way is super convenient to be packing when you want to do things like seduce courtiers or chop off people's heads. God said I could, ha ha. But this also means a knight is 
always beholden to kings and that mouthpiece of his. Whether or not the orders agreed with the knight's conscience, the orders came from God and he was dedicated to that God. So what happened to knights who disobeyed that or somehow dishonored themselves? The ones who the king hits up and said, yo, I'm gonna have your wife tonight or go execute this blind person for bumping into me. And their response was anything other than, oh yeah, 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 man, do whatever you want. Well, a king gave the knight his spurs so he could also take him away. According to Noble Dynasty, when a knight who did something treasonous or cowardly, let me uh, correct, was just accused of doing something treasonly or cowardly because there didn't have to be proof, he got publicly stripped of knighthood in a formal ceremony then executed. And seeing as being a knight meant that could happen at any second, X marks the plot. There must have been those knights with existentialism. The ones who laid up at night wondering if all the infidel killing and pervy chivalry and pillaging and holy calling stuff, what if it's almost but not enough to get you into heaven? Which means you could do pretty much everything right as a knight and still spend sleepless nights worrying that you wouldn't make it past the pearly gates. They were a super religious lot after all. In anticipation of solving this problem, a lot of knights, well, those who made it past their youth anyway, would often join a military order because membership usually came with a plot in a church graveyard. And seeing as they believed even people who were completely without sin could not be guaranteed a place in heaven unless they were buried in a certain kind of dirt, that's better than a pension. And no, not any dirt would do. It had to be consecrated dirt of a church graveyard. According to ancient history encyclopedia, an aging knight would sometimes even enlist at the last possible second for battle so he could be interred beneath a lovely stone effigy in church forever without needing to do or spend any time doing boring churchy stuff. Our world loves class divide and that's no different back then when it sucked to be a poor knight. On that note, contrary to popular belief, not all knights were wealthy with castles and serfs and all that bougie middle age luxury. In fact, some weren't even landowners at all and the rank of knight was more or less something that made one a minor noble like your auntie on city council. Though, of course, many among the knighted held higher positions in nobility separate from their knightly status. This is to do with knight becoming a Nepo baby industry. The lowest class of these knights might even live in their lord's homes, serving more or less as bodyguards, security, occasionally law enforcement, and sometimes judges mediating local disputes. In essence, their day to day was a bit of a mashup between soldier and civil law enforcement. It's like those people you met who wanted to become a cop for the fast action and the pew pew and the speed chases, then learn it's 80% paperwork and painfully slow regiment. As you might imagine, lower ranked and poorer knights love tournaments for a chance to gain prestige, practice their skills, and the chance to acquire additional wealth via prizes and ransoms and the like. So tournaments is next on our list because they were essentially medieval mud melees. Since knights started at not-nosed kids, it was easy to build the ideology of tournaments as fun and exciting into them, the foundation of competitiveness. In the 13th century, tournaments were particularly bloody and death was not uncommon. Initially, the games and tournaments were a little more than massive melees, usually including including real sharpened weapons, there were no rules, and tensions were made intensely high because often they'd group the knights by nation or clan, then pit them against each other that way. Call whoever had that idea Taylor Swift because they wanted bad blood. That said, the general point, unlike real battle, was not to intentionally kill your opponent, but just to knock them off their horse, steal their armor and horse, and take them prisoner until the tourney is over. That being said, dull weapons weren't introduced into tournaments for hundreds of years, and they also used lances to launch each other they're off of horses at full speed, so realistically death is inevitable. One notable tournament took place in 1274 when King Edward I was pitted against the Count of Shalons. As the king and the count battled it out, dozens of soldiers from each side got involved and lost their lives. And these tournaments often took up whole villages. This is because they weren't much different from actual battle, so knights could take off and hide in a peasant's house from the opposing team, which was often then ransacked and burnt. Essentially being a medieval peasant was like living in Avengers Universe New York where at any Second, your whole house could be obliterated in a blink and you miss it style by a group of battling morons. Losing your life can suck, but so can losing your gear because knights buy their own armor. The biggest barrier to entry for those who are peasants or serf turned knight was the absurdly high cost of equipment. Remember, this was centuries before governments decide to arm their troops for combat. You want to be blessed by the divine right to be controlled by me, the king, your whole life and have no freedom, property, life, money, individualism of your own, only to die stupidly in a field somewhere, well you also need to buy your own armor. Being a knight was a fat rip off. Mostly you were paid in land ownership or sometimes just by the glory of your lord. And that's because the system benefited noblemen who grew up in it. Not much different from how things work nowadays. So any armor or weapons you needed had to be purchased.
purchased on the side with money you were never given. It's no problem for the knights of noble birth, but other knights would have to work the land and sell goods just to earn enough. Yes, it is also a tin can and it's one size only. Have fun rebuying pieces when weight fluctuates. One outlier though is new research and digital recreations show that knights were actually able to tumble, climb, chop wood, jump on horses, and run quite easily all in armor. So if you're scared of never being able to fit in again, never get out of it. Not like they washed much anyways. And while it can keep you safe, it can put a target on your back too. Held for Ransom is next. And if you've ever watched a movie such as Gladiator, Braveheart, 300, Troy, to name a few, then you may recall that some dudes always wore special armor during battle, and some wore none. If you were rich enough or important enough, you could have the best of the best armor, made of the strongest but lightest materials to gain a defensive edge on the battlefield, all at the low, low price of your daddy's money. And it wasn't exclusive to any kingdom, so that means in one oh moment for everyone battling one another, knights realized that if they saw opponents in incredibly strong or elaborate armor, not to kill that guy, but keep him. Captured instead, a ransom could be demanded for a nobleman knight, because only well-off knights wore such good armor, so that's what you get for flashing your stack, I guess. Worst case Ontario, if the ransom doesn't work out and none of your boys are a sizes 12 is 88s in tin seam, you can melt them down for some pieces of your own. Hey, what sucked more than the medieval knight? being married to one. Like so many of the sickest jobs in history, being a knight was exclusively reserved for the owners of a ding -a -ling. Their wives were expected to sit at home, not learning to kill people with a broadsword or pile driving her buddies into a pile of dung, their bloodlust going offensively unsatiated. Unless their husband died like a moron, that is. In that case, in a very un Middle Ages twist, women were expected to fulfill all their husband's knightly duties. This included protecting their new lord and making sure his land didn't fall into disrepair repair. Only women didn't get any of the cool stuff that came with it, like respect or equality or acknowledgement by history. They got armor though, which is pretty sick. Unsurprisingly, the wives seldom waited for their husbands to get gored by a lance before getting all up in the business of running the show. He could literally drop at any time, so homegirl had to be ready. This resulted in night wives actually being significantly more skilled and diplomatically inclined than their husbands. The duties generally expected of a knight's wife included everything from organizing the defenses of their state to arranging marriages for their servants. This was on top of being at beck and call for their husbands 24 hours a day. I wonder how many of these men really met their ends of their own accord, and how many met their end when she didn't need him anymore. It has the effect Taco Bell has on the average 21st century person. Dentistry. Dentistry is a disease caused by tainted food and drink, causing intestinal inflammation leading to excessively frequent and uncontrollable diarrhea to the point of death. So yeah, Taco Bell. Generally, no one was safe. A fact, 15th century Italian polymath Girolamo Savona, the Savonarola made clear when he observed that dentistry affected not only in the same house, but in the entire locale and moving from a child of 10 or 15 to a sexagenarian. Savonarola himself came down with the disease in 1495. Now this included knights battling knights. On English invasion of France, King Henry II had brought a well-trained and disciplined army who were riddled with this disease. The tough-tested veterans could handle the fever and the fatigue, but the constant loss of bowel control presented a massive stinky problem on the eve of an already ominous battle. So the English set up their position on one side of a narrow field, which lay between two forested areas. The narrow approach allowed the limited number of men-at-arms to stretch across the front, while the archers took stationary positions on the flanks angled inward with a row of protective stakes in front. Thanks to their stationary positions, the archers suffering from dentistry simply dropped their pants and shot their arrows. They also dipped their arrows in it to add insult to injury as the world's worst psychological and bio-warfare duo. I mean, can you imagine an arrow covered in that flying at you? Yeah, they won. By a lot. And topping our list is a reminder that our mental well-being is not solely a thing of the present. It's PTSD. From crime statistics and letters of pardons, historians can see that people in the middle ages were no more violent than we are today. And yes, they exercised it in its most extreme forms, but this violence was not through nature nor culture, rather simple direction. Whilst following their orders, those battle experiences could leave them with a very serious case of PTSD. This is backed up by a book that was actually written by a knight who lived in the first half of the 14th century. His name was Girofi de Charny, and he was one of the most respected knights of his age. The book about the life of a knight actually includes the psychological consequences. These 
these symptoms ring true of PTSD. In his book, Dicharni advises knights on how to relate to the fact that they must kill people when they are at war, how to mentally endure the hardships knights face, poor sleep, hunger, emotional numbness, loneliness, and a feeling that even nature is going against them. Modern military psychology enables us to read medieval texts like these, or ones of Egypt or Greek battles, and the Mongols spread all in a new way, giving us insight into the perception of violence in the Middle Ages in the general population. In history, we've had a horrible habit of misinterpreting. Easy mistake as inflection doesn't appear on paper, or stone, or stone tablets. Previously, medieval texts were read as worshipping heroes and glorifying violence, but in the light of modern military psychology, we can see the mental cost to knights and of their participation in the gruesome and extreme violent wars in the Middle Ages.